still on mute. Ah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to start kicking off now. And I think uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the, the kind of kickoff keynote talks. Uh, I think this is going to be a lot more fun because we get to be a lot more nerdy here, much less on the businessy kind of side of things. So thanks, everyone, for coming out so early. And hello, people of the internet, I think, are around somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for coming along to Unreal Fest 2022. It's actually really cool for me because it's my first Unreal Fest as well in person in a long time. And it's my first Unreal Fest since joining Epic about two years ago. Uh, so I'm a technical account manager, and I'm with Epic Games based out of Singapore. So I take care of Southeast Asia, which uh, being in Singapore is a really cool place, but it becomes really, really small when you're trapped there for two years. So <laughs> it's great to get out traveling. Uh, it's really cool to be in New Orleans, and uh, my voice might be slightly gone because New Orleans is actually a really fun city, and I've been here a few days already um, doing work, of course. Um, that might involve a few drinks here and there, but uh, it's mostly work. Um, and i got to give thanks. So I got really lucky that one of our other evangelists that was meant to give this talk wasn't able to come. So I, uh, I had to bite the bullet and come all the way out to New Orleans and have fun with everybody here for a, a week. Um, but so I'm going to be talking about making better blueprints. And this will be a, a bit of a mix between some beginner stuff, some advanced stuff, and hopefully a few things that just maybe you didn't know about and you've been doing something for 10 years and then you realize, ah, damn, I could have been doing this a hell of a lot quicker with one button press. Because uh, I normally go through that whenever I watch uh, one of like Chris Murphy's talks or see Ryan Brock's and things as well. So uh, hopefully everyone gets a little bit out of this, um, but we've got a lot more advanced talks and more beginner talks and just a bit of everything over the next few days. So there should be a bit of, uh, bit of everything for, for everyone. So we're going to start things off, um, and this is totally legit. I didn't make this up uh, on the spot at all. But we've got the, the four Cs of uh, blueprints. And we're going with cleanliness, creation, classes and sharing, and communication. Because that, that seems kind of cool to have a bit of a, a tagline to go along with this one. And I actually wanted to start things off with the cleanliness one, because it's something that is pretty often forgotten with uh, blueprints. And it's just programming. If you've got good programming practices, you should follow the same rules with blueprints. And the really cool thing with blueprints is, like, if I need to debug somebody's C++ code and see, is this really bad code? It takes a long time to read through it all. With blueprints, I can just open the screen and look at it and go, wow, um, that's not good. So this is why the first thing we're actually going to talk about is de-spaghettification. So spaghettification is actually a scientific term for getting sucked into a black hole, which you can kind of do with blueprints. Um, but cleaning up the spaghetti code to make sure that it's, it's readable, it's easy to work with, and it's good for when you want to hand it over to another developer, um, they need to know what's going on and how they can start to work with it. So the first kind of tip that I've got here is around color coding. So most people will be familiar with comments, um, but maybe you're not so familiar with being able to actually color code them. So if you've got specific things that happen a lot, whether it's like, okay, this is a movement component, or this one's handling particular type of logic, and we follow this a lot. Um, you can color code those comments. And you can actually go through, and in here, you'll find the same options where you can change the, the size of the font for the headings. You can change whether you're showing the bubble. Um, and you can also change it so that you can move things around differently. But another little tip that I snuck in here is you can actually create color swatches. So on here, I've shown that you can just grab a color, and you can just drag it into the top left there, and you'll start to create a swatch. So you can add multiple colors in there. And this will create a theme for you. So um, I haven't shown it on here, but you can click the little arrow there, and you can name that theme, and you can set up multiple themes. Really handy, because these actually persist across everything. So when you're going into UMG, you can access these same um, themes. And then when some other developer goes, oh, I wonder what that red was, they don't need to go look through the notes and figure out the CMYK values. They just go, oh, that's the green one. Um, so really handy little tip there. Uh, blueprint bookmarks, another one that I see people don't use so often. but in the viewport, you might be familiar with using the bookmarks to move the camera to a location, press control and a, a number, and then you can snap back to there really easily. But you can do the same thing in blueprints. And this will actually remember like the position that you're in as well as the zoom level as well. So when you want to easily be able to jump back to a couple of nodes here, you can just set that and then just press control, one, two, three, four, whatever number, uh, and then you press shift and the number again, and you can jump back to that location, zoomed into that same spot again. And that one people might have picked up a bit, but we actually also have the whole blueprints kind of um, tab that you can open up. So you go into the, the windows and you open up the blueprint, uh, the bookmarks one, sorry. 
So in there, you'll see that we've actually already got one set up straight away for any comments. So any comment boxes that you add automatically get it added in there. But in the little top left button there, you can add new bookmarks. And again, that's gonna record your like location that you're currently looking at as well as the zoom level. So it makes it really easy to snap back to those locations. And this is amazing when you're taking over somebody else's stuff and you don't know where to look, what to find things. So here you can just jump straight to it. It's really nice and easy. Uh, and we kind of already covered a couple of these ones before, but I did want to kind of go back over it again. So if you didn't know how to create a comment, just drag a selection box out across a bunch of blueprint nodes and then press C. That creates your comment box for you. And then again, you can go through, color code it, change whether you want to set it for a color or maybe you want to make the fonts a bit bigger, maybe you don't like the bubbles, maybe you do. Uh, you can also set on the comment boxes when you drag it, whether it drags everything inside it or if it just drags the box. Um, but another one here that it is, it's shown a lot on this one because this is one of our example pieces, but the, the node comments, if you right click on any node, you can actually add comments directly on that node as well. And this is really handy if you've got something which, if you've got to look at it for more than five seconds to try and figure out what that node is doing, a new developer coming onto that one, it's probably gonna sit there for a lot longer than five seconds. So you can just leave little notes directly on those nodes to explain what it's doing, whether it's a bit of a math rotation or something strange where you've gotta um, do a lot of weird math in there, it's good to explain those out to anybody else that's coming on the project, a really nice little feature there. Uh, and the next one we've got is collapsing nodes. So this one's a little bit of personal preference whether you like to do this or not, but again, it's just select them, right click, and you can collapse it down to a node. And what this does is turn it into a single node, but you've still got all of those blueprint nodes and the, the whole graph sitting there that you can jump into. And you can uncollapse that node as well if you change your mind. Um, for me, I don't tend to use that sort of one so much because I like to see like everything that's happening in there. And as long as you've got good programming practices, which again, blueprints is just programming, um, if things are nice and clean, then you often, you don't really need to use those so much. But the one that's showing on the screen at the moment, when you collapse into a function, that is much more useful. Because if you found that you go back and you copy paste a bunch of blueprint nodes over and over in the same blueprint, then you should probably collapse that into a function because then you can just reuse that function. And when you do the collapse, it's gonna create the input and output nodes depending on what you've collapsed there. So if you've got a variable that's going in or out of it, it's gonna have those on there straight away for you. But you can go in and you can change it as well. So you can add new output variables and new input variables and then you can change everything that's happening in there. But then it's just a standard function so you can go back and use it whenever. So it, it's a really nice way of quickly refactoring your um, potentially copy-pasted blueprints that you've got all over the place. And then the math expression node. So this one's a really interesting one, and I didn't do the best demo for it on here. Um, but we can see the only math I've got on this page here is a, a minus one. But I might not know what those values are doing or why it's doing it. So rather than add a comment node on here, I'm actually just naming each of these as variables. So I can say, what's my, my current location minus the character location? Set those as uh, integers. Um, or set them as floats or set them as vectors, whatever you need. And then we can just plug the nodes in there and it's kind of a self-commenting box. Um, and that's a, a nice little change, but if you've got a way more complex algorithm, maybe a program has written something out and you go, okay, I need to do the sign of this and the random of this, take in a couple of variables of it and then do all this math, you can just type that straight into the math node and it generates all of those blueprint nodes for you. And then if you don't wanna keep the math node there, you can actually copy paste out those nodes that it's generated for you and move that back into the blueprint. So if I'm just trying to do a quick basic math, I can type it in there, let it generate the nodes for me, and then I just use the nodes. Um, nice, quick, saves you a bit of time. And the math node itself is just really handy if you wanna have some simplified kind of features in there. And then here's another one which is often a bit misunderstood. So you can actually convert um, over to a pure node uh, on a lot of ones here. So here I highlight them, right click and convert it into a pure node. And I actually started doing it on another one just before the timeline here. So you notice I could get the variable off there, get the Boolean value. And if I can convert that over to a pure one, it just kind of removes the need to have the, the white sort of line going through it to run it from an event. Um, but what it doesn't do there is cache the value. So if I take that one there and I plug it in on the other side, the timeline essentially acts as a loop. So it's going through, every time it ticks over, it's gonna get that value. When you're grabbing the variable directly, it's cached. That value is not changing. It knows that, okay, it was true or it's false, and it's not looking again to see what it's doing. But if I took the value from before the timeline, where it's actually calculating that value, if it's getting called in the timeline, it's gonna do that whole check every single time to go through it. 
So when you're using the pure nodes, make sure you're not running them like on the opposite side of a for each loop, for instance. Um, but it's a really nice, quick, easy way to collapse that entire sort of function there straight into a, a pure node. And it, uh, it, it's just a, a good way to clean things up again. And actually added in a quick bonus one in here, um, validate a get. Again, sometimes you, you need to validate that the value actually exists. So you'll normally get your variable, plug it in, check if it's valid. You can get rid of that, right click on it, turn it into a validated get, and then you've just got a single node to work with. So a lot of this was just how do we clean up our blueprints a little bit? Um, how do we make sure that we're not adding in mess that we don't need? Um, and there's a lot of other times that you might also even be able to just use some inbuilt functions as well. Like we've got our like moved component to or simple move to. Uh, a lot of the times, just look through and see if maybe a blueprint already exists for something that you might have to script out or it's a macro library or something else like that. So trying to keep the blueprints tidy, remembering that it is programming. If you quickly knock something together, go back, change your mind, mess around with it a little bit, it's easy for code to turn into spaghetti. And we want to avoid that, especially when we're working with a large team of developers, making sure that the next person that comes onto the project can really easily understand what's happening, and then they can pick up the code, go through your comments without needing to read a giant textbook of it, and they can get started making changes straight away. Um, another one that is, uh, people get very lazy with tick. <laughs> it's easy to use tick for a lot of things because it's always there and you go, ah, oh, I could create an event for this, but oh, it's already ticking, so I'll just use that. Don't. Um, because when you get to publishing and you start wondering, why is my performance so bad? What's going wrong? A lot of the time, you've got 10 billion objects that are ticking and you might only need five objects to tick. So we can start to look at what some ways that we can tidy up tick and how we can change it. So on the screen here, we just got some useful kind of settings that you can configure through Blueprint. So you can actually fire off to, okay, I need my tick to start here. Or maybe I don't need it to tick every frame. Maybe I only want it to tick every one second for something that's just not updating very often. Or maybe something that's moved a long way off screen, I still need to update it for people, but it doesn't have to happen 60 times a second. It can happen once every second, once every half second. So if you've got a massive factory building game, for instance, and you've got something way off in the distance, you can just update those a little bit lazier. We also got a few other bits here where we look at tick groups. So a tick group allows you to say when that tick should actually happen. And if you found that you've got lots of fast events going off, um, and maybe it's happening uh, at the wrong time, maybe a punch is not hitting properly, maybe physics needs to be done before the tick or after the tick, you can actually change the tick group so you can check when that is actually happening in there. And to get even more precise, we actually have tick prerequisites. So you can define an actor that it should wait to tick before it does. So that can be really handy when you're setting up complex interactions and you wanna say, oh, this variable needs to be like driven from this side, but we're still doing it on tick. How do we make sure that it's getting the correct value at the right time? And this is easily one that people get caught out on a lot and it's tough to debug because you go, why is it sometimes happening this way and different ways on this machine compared to this one? Because the ticking is faster and you're not necessarily in control of that. So a few good ones that you can use to clean up here. Um, and actually I think on the VR project, this one's a really easy one to look at because if you've got something attached to a hand and you're spinning it around, if you're ticking at the wrong kind of group or wrong rate, um, that becomes really noticeable in a VR headset. One that I did want to look at here quickly is how we have some alternatives to ticking. Um, because, yeah, you say, okay, I can use tick, I make an object move around or spin, or I'm checking some other values and updating it. Um, so I threw together a quick little example here from, th this is, most of the stuff I've got up on here is from our content examples hall. So if you haven't looked at the content examples, it's in the, the samples tab of the launcher, which used to be called the learn tab. Um, but the content examples hall, definitely check it out because we kind of detail little bits and pieces of every different part of the engine that you might need to know. Really, really useful. So I took one of these where we're showing um, some gears spinning around and using tick on there, you go, okay, just every tick, check the delta seconds, multiply it by the rate we want to spin and spin the gears. And that's fine, it works, but it's not necessarily the only way to do it and it's not necessarily the best way. If you have a thousand of these different objects in the scene, that's a lot of things ticking trying to do this calculation. So we can actually go through and we can disable that tick completely and we can try some other options for it. So the second one that I've got here is just a loop with a delay on it. And I don't necessarily recommend this process, but it is an option. 
Um, I see people do this a lot where they'll have a delay for one second and then route the, the node all the way back around to the other side. And I don't like to do that because you should never cross the streams and going backwards, you don't want to do either. So I just have a custom event and we call that event again after one second delay or 0 0.2 second delay if we want to tick at that kind of speed. Um, so you can do that. But the other option you've also got is to use the timeline. So with a timeline, you can set that up. Um, when the video loops back around again, we'll get to that one. But the timeline, you can set up and say, okay, I want it to take five seconds for these gears to rotate. And then I'm just taking that value there. Could be a vector, could be a float. Um, and you can just plug that straight in as the value for that one. You can actually set the timelines to automatically play. You can set it to loop. Uh, that may or may not be what you want because you might want a bit more control over when it starts and stops. But that is a component that you can actually call and say, okay, something has happened, stop that timeline from playing. So I'll often actually use this with a one second timer so then I can use a variable to set the play rate on it easily and it gives you a lot of customization. But the, the timeline, if you can disable that tick and just call a timeline when you need to use it, is a really nice way to say, yep, I don't need tick, stop, stop ticking for me. And that'll, that'll definitely help you optimize your project a little bit. One second. And here's a nice little feature as well that is very underutilized. Blueprint lifespans. So the blueprint lifespan one, people often miss it because you're normally destroying your actor when you think you want to destroy it. But then you're writing blueprints or writing C++ to say, hey, I don't need this actor anymore, destroy it for me. But why bother when you've just got a button? You can say, oh, I'm just spawning in a particle effect and a sound for a hit or something like that. Um, that should only exist for three seconds. Using the blueprint lifespan, you can just have it automatically destroy itself after three seconds. And then zero code is better than some code. So it's uh, just a nice, quick, easy one. Just type in your, your lifespan and then um, it'll take care of the killing the actor for you. And finally on ticks, dump ticks. So dump ticks, one word, type it in on the command line and have a look. So this will list out everything in the scene that is ticking for you. It's also gonna show you what tick group and the prerequisites that they've got. So you can actually go through and just check out like how many things are ticking in my scene. If you see a million things ticking in there, maybe it's time to clean things up a little bit. Um, but nice and simple, just fire it up whether you're in the editor um, or you can do it straight uh, when you're running a project as well. But it's good to start debugging and seeing that how many things are ticking that somebody might have forgotten about. And especially when you run into those issues with um, maybe a variable is not updated when you want it to update because it needs a prerequisite or it's in the wrong tick group. Um, so just a quick recap on there. Like you can manually set to start and stop the, the ticking on every blueprint. You can adjust the intervals. You can adjust the ticking groups. You can set your prerequisites. And maybe you can use a timeline or a looping event instead and check out Blueprint Lifespan. Like if it's just a quick event that only needs to spawn a particle or something, Blueprint Lifespan is a great way to not bother writing a new event, listening for when it should die or anything else in there, and you can get rid of tick entirely because a lot of you might have just been using that to create a quick timer to destroy it. And then test it all out with dump ticks. Um, that'll help you debug, and it's, it's a great way to just check on a lot of stuff that like maybe you didn't build all those blueprints are ticking, but you want to go back through and do some optimization. So next bit we want to look at is soft references. Another one that is often a bit misunderstood, and this is why I actually went back to check on what our documentation says about it and what video content and things we've done about it. So Christian Allen, one of our other evangelists, did a, a talk with Victor Broden a, a few years ago now. Um, but I really liked his quote because I used to be a web developer for about 10 years before I thankfully made the, the jump out and got into <laughs> interactive stuff instead. Um, but if you look at a soft reference the, the same way that you might look at a web link, like you click on a URL, it's gonna take you somewhere, and then it's gonna load up that object and tell you what it is. A soft reference is very much the same sort of way of looking at things. All it's doing is saying, hey, here's this uh, object or actor that I wanna know about. Um, I'm keeping track of where it is in the future so that when I want it, I can grab it. Compared to if you just say, okay, I wanna spawn actor, it's gonna be able to spawn that actor in and know that it exists. So that gets loaded in straight away. Even if, if you've got a spawn actor node sitting on your blueprints, even if it's not plugged in, it's gonna load whatever that actor is into memory so that if it was plugged in or if you wanna do something with it, it's ready to go straight away because you don't wanna have to wait five seconds for a giant FBX file or something to load in. So it needs to know that it's there. So this is where we use soft references. So you can say, okay, I'm about to load in this asset. Maybe I've got a character that's got 50 different weapons or a thousand different pieces of clothing that you want. 
you don't want to load in all of that clothing as soon as you load the game, because that'd take a long time. And then especially when you're only wearing one piece of clothing at a time, um, you can just use a soft reference to say, okay, I'm going through my menu, I'm checking my clothing items, uh, this is the next one I need to load. Use the async load asset, and then when it's completed, it'll load up that asset for you. And then you can do whatever else you need with it, save it out as a variable, use it as a standard hard reference by that point, but up until then, that is just sitting there waiting to be loaded. And a lot of people get caught out on this because if you're using hard references, it's really easy to get into a long chain of hard references. If you've got one blueprint that's referencing another, which is another and another, you can actually end up with really long chains of assets that are loaded in that you might not even need until the credits. But if you've loaded it, it's gonna load up straight away at the start. So use the soft references. You can actually go through and, again, run a quick command to check what these um, references are and see what's loaded into memory. If you're seeing a lot of stuff loaded into memory that like, you don't need in that level at the moment, it means you probably gotta go back through, do a bit of refactoring, change the blueprints so that you got a soft reference on there. And especially if you're using data tables with massive lists, make sure <laughs> everything in there is a soft reference rather than a hard reference. Otherwise, you could instantly load up a thousand things that you don't care about until you, you suddenly care about. Blueprint debugging. Um, this one is like probably most people are familiar with. You go into your blueprints, right click, at a breakpoint. We actually have a full blueprint debugging tool that you can go through. So in here, you can open it up in a window. You can do it in the viewport or straight in the blueprint that you're in, um, and then it'll automatically select it. But here we can then see all the ones of this um, class that are in the level. We can then actually go through, and remember when we wanted to see what tick was doing what, what events were happening when, we can actually go through and see the whole timeline of all these events that are happening. And then we can go through, check all the breakpoints that we had, maybe they're disabled, we can turn them back on again. When it does the break, we can then actually get a view of what are the variables set at that particular time. Like, when I did that breakpoint, what's happening on the screen, what's running through memory, anything else that we need to debug through. Because I know for years, I didn't know about this one, and I just put breakpoints all over the place and had to step constantly to try and check, add watch um, on the values all the time. But this is a great way to just check anything that you've got. Um, any value that you are watching will show up in the, the list on the right-hand side there, so you can see all the, the vector values are straight in there. Really good way to um, just kind of bring your debugging game up a little bit. And this one is a new tool with 5.1. So 5.1 is in preview at the moment, so you can grab it from the launcher. Um, don't build a game with it yet, but check it out. Uh, a lot of cool new stuff in there, but this one's quite nice, because all that we've been talking about so far at the moment is how to make your blueprints a little bit tidier, how to make it easier for people to work with, and how to optimize a bit more. But sometimes the best blueprint is no blueprint. And sometimes you do want to move into C++ and refactor a bit of that blueprint code. But to get started in C++, it's a, it's a big jump to go from blueprints. So with the new Blueprint header tool, you can actually go through and get it to generate all those C++ headers for you straight away. That makes it much easier. You can just copy it straight out of there, go into C++, and use that as a starting point. Really nice little tool in 5.1. Definitely check it out. So I zoomed in on this video a bit too late, but it's the same thing. So maybe you can see a little bit clearer here that, yep, as soon as we add in a function, it's generating in that header, and as soon as we add in any variables, it's gonna do that as well. So it just makes it much easier for us to get started, especially as if you're a beginner in C++ and you don't really know what all the headers are. It's a really nice way to make it just a bit easier to go, okay, maybe later on I will shift that into C++ because I'm not quite getting the performance I want, or maybe I wanna hand it over to a programmer. Okay, so that was everything that I had on cleanliness. And I hope that people got a few nice tips out of that one because it really is important to just think that Blueprints, it's programming. It's a different style of programming, but if you have bad programming practices in C++, you get the same issues in Blueprints. It's just far easier for us to tell when someone's been lazy in Blueprints because it looks like spaghetti. So we can fix that with a few of those tips, hopefully. Next bit I'm gonna go into is creation. So Blueprints are really, really good for being able to create content, whether it's with edit utility widgets or just spawning things in a level. You can do a lot with blueprints. And I'm not gonna go too much into construction scripts because I'm sure most people here know what construction script is. You set up your code in there and it's gonna run whenever something changes to that actor. If you move it around the level, it's gonna fire off every single tick. Um, which can be good and bad. 
Um, but maybe you don't want that, maybe you want some different functions instead. So we'll look at a few different options for what you can use instead of construction script there. But here's a nice little example of that construction script that you just kind of saw on screen there is running this one here, where we're using the, the spline. Um, so we've got a spline component that we can add into any blueprint, which then lets you drag it out throughout the, the world. So you can hold alt and drag new spline points on there. Really great if you're trying to generate pipes or roads or landscape or anything. But you can take that spline and then build on top of it, get the points that it's got, get the um, direction, rotation, length, axis. You can animate objects along it. You can spawn actors all across it. But then in the same way, you can say, okay, at these many points, I want to trace down and I want to see, is there a rock there? Is there grass there? Should I spawn something there? Um, what's the angle and rotation and tangent? And we can, we can check all that and then create new meshes with it. So a nice way to do that, which you can see in this example, is we actually use the exposed functions on it. So Another really cool little feature that's just hidden behind one little box. When you create a um, custom event in a blueprint, there's a little one there that's called call in editor. If you tick that um, and make sure it's exposed for that blueprint, you then get a button on the side here. So those little buttons, which are the delete drops, drop mesh, and drop meshes, that enables us to call those custom events directly when we're in the editor. So this lets us use it to design these worlds and create custom tools that we have for it. So we can move around that spline, see where it's gonna go. Then when we drop it, we actually spawn those as static meshes in the world, which you can then merge or turn into instances and everything, however else you want. But we're able to get really complex kind of creation tools out of this and just fire those events off when we need to, rather than saying, okay, let's do everything on begin play. Um, this is here for, for level designers. So as a blueprint artist or a tech artist or a programmer or anyone, you can come through and you can start creating these tools and go, how do I want to design my world? What do my developers need to make this world better? Start making these tools for them and just, yep, again, one click and suddenly call in editor and then you've got buttons there to work with. Um, but maybe you want to interact with a lot of different things in the world at one time. So again, this content examples level, if you haven't checked it out, you definitely have to because it's, it's amazing. Um, even the math hole in here is awesome. If you're ever wondering why uh, there's some weird, crazy numbers happening in materials and things, and you don't know when you would ever use that, because that was most students when you go into a math class and go, oh, I'm never gonna use that. But then suddenly you get into vector math and go, oh, I need this for computer games. And then you gotta figure out how to deal with it. So the math hall in the content examples and everything else in the content examples is great, but we've had that since UE 4.0. And it was starting to look a little bit old, so we wanted to update it and show off all the cool new stuff that we've got in UE 5. So rather than go through and collect every single example in there, because there's hundreds and they're all in these fancy little plinths like a museum, so we wrote some editor utility blueprints for that. So we've got both editor utility blueprints and editor utility widgets, but one of the ways you can use an editor utility blueprint is you can do it as a scripted actor action. So when we right click on something in the scene, we can then get a little menu there that says, okay, we wanna run this action. And then that's gonna go through whether that might be Python or Blueprint or C++. We can trigger all of that from there to then do a bunch of events. Um, so one of these events was, okay, go through, find everything with this Blueprint type, which is the, the display cabinet, and replace it. Update it, change the meshes, change the sizes, uh, and make it look like it should for UE5. And uh, that saved, let's say, several dozen or hundreds of hours of work of very manual, tedious work. So that's really optimizing somebody's workflow and letting them focus on the much more creative parts, which is, is awesome. Um, but we can actually use the editor utility widgets and blueprints to create uh, fun new stuff with it as well. So uh, I kind of put one together a while ago, which I just wanted to make a bit of a mess. And instead of just spawning actors, moving them around all the time manually, um, I thought, why don't I just use the inbuilt physics that we've got in the engine and just spawn a bunch of rocks, spawn trees, throw everything around as if there's been a bit of a landslide, um, and then we can bake that physics straight out. So if you're not aware, uh, if you've got a, a mesh selected and you've got physics enabled on it and gravity's on, if you simulate or press play, that's gonna simulate and let's go. Uh, but if you select that one and you press K on your keyboard, that's actually gonna save the simulation state. So what it does is go, okay, I was up here and I was just sitting flat and then you drop me on the floor, if you wanna record that location, press K, and it's gonna update its transform to be that location now. So you can save out where all that physics object was. That's, it's a really, really cool one because if I just wanna naturally scatter things around on the floor, there's no better way than just to make it happen. 
um, rather than manually trying to place everything. So run the simulation, press K, and then it's gonna save in that new location, and then you can adjust it afterwards and tidy it up, but that's gonna be its new location to work with. Um, let me restart this one. Um, and the video stopped for some reason. But from here, I actually went through and just say, okay, rather than me just doing one or two at a time, um, why don't I spawn hundreds or thousands of them? So using a editor utility widget, I created a, a nice little widget here which lets me um, use the details picker so that I can just drop in any different asset that I want. Uh, I then used a few of the um, editor subsystems that we've got. So a lot of those meshes, I just bought them in from Quixel and maybe some of them didn't have collision on them. I didn't wanna have to go through and generate collision for everything manually, so I just made one button which gets all those meshes, generates a, a convex collision mesh for it. Um, like I didn't provide too many details because I was just going quick and easy to drop it on the floor, but it generates all the collision. Then when I say spawn trash, it actually starts the simulation, makes all the physics happen. Then when I wanna bake, I just press one button again, it goes through, it essentially selects all those assets, presses K on the keyboard, then stops the simulation. Then everything is saved. And then I can quite easily go through and use the, the mesh merge tool to save them all out as instances instead. So then I can have hundreds of thousands of objects in the scene. Um, even on this one, when it was, when the video was playing again, um, I had tens of thousands of assets that were all multi-million polygon nanite meshes. And I was able to drop hundreds of them at a time bake it out, and they're all instances, so it, uh, it runs pretty well after that. Um, and another one that I looked at, so a while ago, my colleague uh, Andrea Sweeker and I, we did a bit of a video called um, VR Puppeteering. So we set it up so that you could use Vive controllers and um, drive the dragon around like a little puppet. And that gave us a lot of really expressive control over it, because like, we could use our face with live link face and do, do a bit of mocap and record all that. But because he's actually a puppeteer, so he knows how to do things with hand puppets and everything. Um, I wanted to give him much better control over like, seeing what's happening, because normally you would see there and you have a TV screen to look at it from different angles. So I actually set up another little blueprint here where I'm just spawning uh, scene capture cameras from multiple angles around the character, which then, again, I just had a little picker here. I could use the picker, select the, the dragon that I wanted to currently sort of mocap and perform with add those cameras around it, which are then just whitelisted to only be that character pawn. Then we could show all the different camera angles that we've got for them. But then we could also look at what's our input. So in this instance, I just had it configured with the Xbox controller, but we were then moving into VR, and we configured it so that as you move further away, like those values will change. Knowing where the limit is of here's one, here's minus one is pretty tough. But so we just visualized all that on screen with a couple of little um, progress bars that I customized the look of a little bit. And then that gives you much better insight into, okay, I'm reaching the limits here and I can adjust things. But this was, again, just a quick little edit utility widget, drop it in the scene, and then we're just using take recorder so that we record out all these animations and then we can use that uh, instead of mocap. And then go back through sequencer, tidy it up a bit with control rig. But this drastically changes how people can actually create content and opens it up much more for the creatives to, to just work on creating that content, not needing to worry about the tools and it gives a much better insight into what's happening in the world there. So Geometry Script is another new one uh, in UE5. This is a really, really cool tool. So we used it really heavily in Lyra, which is uh, another example, which if you jump into the, the samples tab, you'll find Lyra. It's, uh, it's kind of like Unreal Tournament. You've got a multiplayer shooter game there. Really good example of a lot of content but most of the, like, the spaces in the world here are actually built with geometry script. So here you're seeing one of those um, scripted actor actions again, where we can convert from that static mesh, which is optimized, it's good to have at runtime, uh, but we can jump back to a geometry script here, where we've set up some blueprints that let us configure a bunch of values with it, where you can easily go from, okay, here's a massive hallway opening, to suddenly I want this to be a window instead. So for a level designer, rather than needing to go right back out go over to their 3D modeler and say, hey, can you create me a new doorway? Can you change this? I need to tweak everything. Getting rid of that backwards and forwards to say, I just want to make a tiny tweak here. And then you can convert that back into a static mesh afterwards. So all of this is sitting in the Lyra example. You can go through, check out all the blueprints, see how it's running. But the really cool thing with Geometry Script is, this works in runtime as well. So you can actually have this 
whether it's uh, like a level editor in a game or whether you just use it as part of the programming. I've seen some really cool examples around of people doing like a ball kind of rolling through a hill and carving it out at runtime. It's, if you're working on a like billion polygon nanite mesh, it's maybe not a good idea, um, but whether it needs to be a good idea doesn't necessarily stop you from trying it out. So it's a, it's a, lot, <laughs> a lot of fun that you can have with it. Um, so definitely check out geometry script and see whether it changes how you might like to design levels. You don't have to just use the box for, for everything anymore. Um, using the new modeling tools that we've got, combining it with geometry script, you can create these really nice tools that gives a level designer far more capability than just working with the assets that they've been provided. So um, definitely check out Lyra. It's, it's a really good example, and I think you'll, you'll find a lot of cool stuff in there. There's, there's way more on top of the geometry script there as well, because it's all running through a lot of networking, it's multiplayer, um, and it's designed to be cross-platform and everything as well. So really cool example that you can check out for that one. Uh, and now we move into the classes and sharing side of things. So this one, again, there's a lot of uh, information here, and there's a lot of different ways you can do things. So there's no one particular way that you should do this stuff, but it's really good to start to like have a bit of a rethink about how you handle this, and just trying to understand like the way the engine works and the way it wants to work. If you can kind of work within those constraints and work with the engine rather than fighting it, use some of the inbuilt tools will really um, like speed up your development quite a bit. So looking at class inheritance, um, it's one that you may kind of be familiar with from a few bits when you look at like our, our character and our pawn and our controller. There's pre-configured ways that Unreal is kind of set up to work. And like you don't have to follow that. It's just there's a lot of good ways of um, working with those content rather than fighting against it. But when you work with a blueprint, you can actually create a child of that blueprint. So let's say we have an interactable object. Maybe we're, we're making an open world sort of game and we want to be able to pick up objects or destroy them or shoot people with them. There's a lot of things that we need to interact with in the world and there's usually pretty consistent kind of um, gameplay things that need to happen with that, whether it's, oh, I need to see what it is or I need to connect it to my hand or I need to be able to interact and destroy it to collect something out of it. Let's say our top level actor can be an interactable. So, Anything else that is also interactable can be a child of that blueprint, and it's gonna inherit the, the rules that have come with that blueprint there. So any other events and things it's got access to. The begin play event, it's gonna have that as well. Um, but if we create a child of that and say, okay, let's create all our resources. We got rocks, we got trees, we got whatever else we wanna create. Suddenly, a month down the line, you say, oh, let's add crystals. We, we want new resources for people to work with, rather than go and copy paste blueprints again and go back through it. If you just create a child of your resource one, it's okay, it's gonna inherit all of that. It's gonna bring in all the variables that I had with it. It's gonna have all those blueprints that I had with it. And then it's really easy for you to just go, okay, let's add a new resource, new, new, new. And you can keep building that out without needing to recreate the entire blueprint. Or hopefully no one's ever doing this, copy pasting from other blueprints and recreating it all the time. Because we, we don't wanna do that. Um, but kind of understanding how that sort of works so this sort of quick example here, you can see we're taking the interaction stuff here. So it's, yep, anything that's an interactable is gonna receive this event. Um, but when we create it, we're using a data table, which I'll go into in a little bit. But we do that to say, okay, I'm this resource type, what mesh should I have, or what color should I be, how many points am I worth, or how many resources should I get out of it. You can generate that when you spawn the actor so that it doesn't need to have everything kind of hard coded in there at the start. So, you, you can work in this sort of form, or there's a few different ways you can use to generate the mesh. Another one, I didn't put up a video of it, unfortunately, but it, it's a little bit unknown of when you've got a variable in there. So let's say you have a Boolean or a float that you wanna plug in, or maybe it's a name or a type or anything else that you wanna have with it. If you make that instance editable, and then also go through and say, okay, uh, I want this one to be um, available on spawn. So you can expose it on spawn so that when you say, hey, I want a spawn actor, you'll actually get another little box there which says, okay, what's the Boolean value? What's the name? What's the type? What's all these kind of variables that you said that you wanted to expose on spawn? They're exposed on spawn. So all this kind of code that's running for the checking on the data table here, maybe you move that into the parent one and uh, do it from there. It, it really depends on the sort of structure that you've got and what you might need. But it's good to know that, yep, you can tick one box and then not have to have all this blueprint code here just have it in the, the other objects that was generating it. And an important one to know is that when you do create a child object, a child actor, 
you will get this weird one. So everybody would have seen the event begin play because that's normally where you'll put a bunch of stuff. And sometimes a lot of things that shouldn't be in there, you put it there anyway because you know it's going to fire off when that gets created. But when you've got a child, you're also going to get access to the parent. So that parent event is all going to fire off. And you can modify it, you can change it, you can override it. Uh, or you can say, I don't actually want that because I'm making a really different kind of resource. I still wanted to be able to get the interactable part of it, but I want to ignore all the rest of it because I don't want them to be able to pick this thing up or maybe it's locked out for some reason. So you can override these events and you can say, okay, maybe there's a particular rule in here I want to do it in some instances and not in others. So uh, that makes it really easy for you to override that. So don't be afraid of using child blueprints just because you think, oh, I want to change some of the stuff that was happening in there, so I just, I'll recreate 90% of it and do it because I need it slightly differently. No, just use these ones and just say, okay, ignore this or change it. And you can actually go through and override a lot of the stuff. So another one that might be slightly hidden, um, you've actually got the overrides in here. So when you check the functions, just hover over the functions header and you'll see that there'll be a little overrides one. And in the overrides, you can see everything that is available to this child blueprint. Um, and that might be coming in through um, an instance. It might be coming in, um, or oh, an interface, sorry. It might be coming in through the parent or on its current actor. So you can go through and you can override all those events, change it, and say, yep, I want this one to be really different than the other ones. And so you, you get full control over how you handle this and what you want to override and what you don't. So it makes it much easier for you to say, okay, yep, it's pretty close, so I will stick with the, the child blueprint to get all the benefits of that, um, but you can go through and you can modify it afterwards. So data tables is one that, like I sort of touched on a little bit before, but if you haven't used these before, they are, they're really awesome. Um, and I, I've done a lot of work with different data and things before I was doing like IoT monitoring on industrial equipment before I came to Epic to work on more fun stuff. Um, but we're working with billions of data points in lots of Excel spreadsheets and things. So data tables are really useful in that sense because if you have tons of data sitting somewhere, I've seen far too often people put inside an actor blueprint and go, okay, we'll create a struct and turn that into an array and we'll put all our values in there. No, don't do that. <laughs> it's, it's a bad idea to have things that you can't easily kind of debug. You don't necessarily know where that data is, what's happening with it. Uh, and maybe you need other blueprints that also need to call that. So a data table uh, lets you access that from any blueprint quite easily. You can just call it up and get them by the row name or get the particular row and things, and you get all those values in there. You can actually now also do composite data tables as well. So if you've got a bunch of developers that need to be working on different parts of the data, you can have multiple data tables and create a composite data table to bring them together so then your blueprint can just look at that composite data table and work with that. A nice little example is, let's say if I was building a tower defense game and I have hundreds of waves and I need to say, okay, I've got to spawn these different types of monsters, but I'm on level five, and so how should I have that? You can say, here's what we're spawning in. This is their upgrades, this is their damage, this is everything. You can do the same with the towers, so that you know, okay, at level two, it's got this amount of damage and it does this damage over time to these type of characters. So you can set all your values in here and really exciting for a lot of the data science people is that this all links directly into a CSV as well. So uh, you can right click on your data table asset, export it out as a CSV or a JSON, do something else with it. But you can also import that CSV and turn it into a data table. So as long as you've created the struct, which will define like what the column types are, so you say if this is a float, a name, a texture, whatever. Um, once you got that defined, you can just drop your CSV in, tell it it's this type of struct, it'll create that data table for you. But because a lot of the time we'll be doing balancing and things in the game itself, and you've got it in the blueprint programming, but it's much more efficient if it's just looking at a value in a data table rather than trying to calculate, oh, okay, it's plus 10% and I've done this and I need this. If it's gonna do all that math, it's, it's taking up computation time. But if you have a big Excel spreadsheet where you are already doing all these calculations, maybe you had a macro or just some rules that were saying, okay, this is 10% harder here and this one's 5% more damage on these ones, you can just have that save out as like hard values so then all you're looking at is a number in here. And then when you want to go back and rebalance, when your players all say, oh, it's too hard on this level, or these guys don't do enough damage, you just go back, change one value in your spreadsheet, bring the CSV back in, and it's all updated, and suddenly they're a bit easier or a bit harder. Um, nice, quick, easy ways, again, just to avoid needing to do that code at runtime is going to give you a lot more headway to um, do more stuff. Um, function and macro libraries, another one that like it's personal preference how you kind of want to use these ones, but you can save out a function library so that you can then call it up in any other blueprint. 
And that's really good. Again, if you're doing repetitive tasks or if you find that you've got to do the same thing over and over and over again, or if maybe you've just got a, a simple macro that's doing some math that you need for something and you keep having to copy it out of one blueprint, put it into another one, if you turn that into a macro library, then anybody can just grab that one, pull it up in their blueprints, and then not really need to worry too much about it. Um, it's, it's just a nice way of kind of cleaning things up, but also if you say, okay, we've got this complex math that's happening in here, and we need to use this in 10 different things, or maybe you want to use it to drive a dynamic material instance, and it's, it's driving 50 different blueprints at once, but then you decide, oh, it's going too fast, we want to slow it down. You don't want to have to go back and find every single one of those blueprints and materials that's using it. You can just go back into your macro library and just update that number. And that's, that's both good and bad, because when you do that, you kind of need to go, okay, where is this being used? If I change this here, is it going to update my player speed? Suddenly they're going to be flying instead of walking. So keep that in mind when you're creating these macro libraries. It's, it's really good for you to be able to work with it, but it can also be uh, a bit dangerous if you don't test and check what's happening. Um, so it, it's, it's good to just keep that in mind. And the last sort of section we're going to look at now is in communication. So how do you get blueprints to talk to each other? Or maybe not just talk to blueprints, talk to um, other pieces of code that's happening or other external events and things like that. So I've realized we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to quickly jump through these ones, I think. Um, so another one that people quite often go to is just, OK, find all the actors in the level and do a cast to that one and then hope that it's that one and um, trigger the event from there. You very rarely want to be doing that. Um, we've got a lot of different ways that you can communicate between blueprints. So having a bit deeper look into how I'm doing this, especially if you're doing a get all actors in a level, that's, you're doing the wrong thing, most likely. <laughs> it's very rare that you actually want to do that, but it is kind of the easiest way that people get started in these ones. So when we look at another one here, it's uh, event dispatching and binding. It's a really handy tool here. And I'm going to go back to my web developer days and say that if you've done any of that stuff, you can consider this kind of like a pub sub, the publisher subscriber agreement. So on start here, we're actually saying, okay, I want to bind to this event. Um, and here we're actually saying, okay, I want to look at the game mode and I'm going to bind to an event that's happening there. And then I'm going to trigger uh, something that happens when it goes off. So essentially you're going to be having a broadcast that can go out to multiple different blueprints. Anybody that has set up to be listening to this is going to receive that broadcast, like you've dialed in your AM radio, for those of us old enough to remember what that is. Um, it's going to be listening for that signal, and then it's going to fire that event. So you, you, can, you can trigger these in a few different ways. You can drop straight into the event there, or you've got another way you can do it, event binding as well, so that you can clean things up a little bit and keep it separate, um, or event dispatcher, sorry. So it's up to you. You drag off the red pin from the event when you create that. So this is one of, if not the only times that you're ever going to go backwards from a blueprint, and it's that little red pin. You'll drag it out, and then you can bind to that event. So there's lots of different bindings that'll be in there by default. So here, this update resources one is one that we've created in that other node, but a quick one will be like on mouse click or something. You can get that from another blueprint or from the current blueprint you're in, bind to that, and multiple other actors can listen to that. So if you set it up and say, when someone interacts with this, then it needs to talk to these five different blueprints. And instead of needing to cast, get each of them, and maybe it fails, maybe it doesn't exist, you can just jump straight in with this. They're all listening to the event, and they will trigger it. And well, you can see that a little bit closer there. Interfaces is another method here. And th this is another one that is really, really awesome, but it's often quite misunderstood, because it's a little bit hard to figure out how should I do it, what's the interface. When you create the interface, it just seems like a blank screen, and all you've got to name. But that's kind of the benefit of it there. So, an interface lets you communicate with other ones that have implemented that interface. So you create an interface kind of the same way you create a normal, well, slightly different than a normal blueprint. When you right click in there, don't go into the, the blueprint class one, there's a little blueprint section there. And that's the same place you, you create the blueprint functions and the blueprint macros. But you go in there and you create an interface. And then in the interface, you can actually create multiple different functions. So you can set up then to implement that interface. So any blueprint that you say to implement the interface, that little one over there, it's then going to have those functions available to it. So you can broadcast to that interface, and you can also be listening to that interface. So a quick one that we can see here is when we want to interact uh, with, a, with something that we set up previously through all our interactables. We can have that interface on them so that we can handle that communication. It might be that I'm hovering over this one now. Is that something I can interact with when I pull the trigger? If I've got the controller and I reach down, I pick it up, okay, I can interact with them, it's gonna send the event. 
but it means that we're not telling it what to do on the interaction side. It's the interactable object that implemented that interface. It's gonna receive an event. And then in there, we can tell it what to do. We can say, oh, we wanna destroy it. We wanna pick it up. We wanna add it to our inventory. It's gonna handle that on that side, which gives you much more control. So all we're doing here, again, and it's a broadcast, it's gonna send it out, and the receiver's gonna do something with it. So this gives you much more control over what you wanna do with things and how you should communicate. And this is usually probably one of the best ways that you wanna handle that for, for most things. And it's, tagging is one that we can do to kind of cut back on, if you had something that was get all actors of class, you probably don't want that. You can do a get all actors with tag. But again, interfaces is probably the way you wanna do it. Um, and it just makes things much, much smoother when you've got that. Just look at these as different kind of use cases for what you might want there. And I got two seconds left. So that's where you set the tags if you need to, but you can still do it through blueprints. And last one, just because we were showing the spline example there, what we were doing was running a line trace down to check the different points. We can check the tangents. We can check what the actor is that we hit. This is normally what you do when you want to shoot something, uh, or if you're just looking, you want to see, oh, is this thing in front of me at the camera, or can I, in, can I interact with it? You line trace out, but more than just going, oh, yes, I hit something a meter away, it's going to tell you what it hit, what the angle is, what the normal is, everything you want to do to interact with it there. So somehow managed to get through all of that with only 37 seconds over time. So I hope everybody learned a few pieces from that one. Um, thanks a lot.
OK, let's go ahead and get started as soon as my slides come up. There we go. All right, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk, Enter the Rumbleverse. I'm John Moore. I work as a graphics engineer at Iron Galaxy Studio on our game, Rumbleverse. A little background about myself to get us started. I've been at the studio since 2011, when I was actually our very first intern. My focus throughout my entire tenure here has been on rendering, especially platform-specific optimizations across a bunch of different game engines. I began working professionally in graphics right in the lead up to the announcement of the GCN GPU architecture councils from Sony and Microsoft, the PS4 and Xbox One, if you're not familiar. And they've been, a big they've been a big focus of my career over the past decade. I've deeply enjoyed some of my past work on titles like Killer Instinct and Borderlands 2. Uh, but working as the rendering lead on Rumbleverse since very early on in its development has been by far my most exciting work on what is definitely the largest project Iron Galaxy has ever developed. As such, I'm very excited to talk to you about some of that work today. So, Rumbleverse is a 40-player battle royale game featuring exclusively melee combat on an island arena that's approximately one kilometer squared in size. And it features a large amount of character customization through our, through our accessory system. For some context, if you're not familiar with the game, here's our launch trailer. Looking for action? You found it! Welcome to the Rumble! Glorious warriors are gathered here today. It's been long enough, ain't no way enough. Came to shake them up, running to interrupt. Wake you, wake them up. Time to go to work, no delaying us. No replacing us, never change it up. Made the game adjust. No one about to light them up. Let them know what's up. We're back. We're back. There's a real energy radiating off the competitors today. What an outstanding match! Okay, so for some more technical details on the project, we shipped across all the Sony and Microsoft consoles from the past and current generation, and we run using DirectX 11 on PC. Our original gold standard performance target was to minimize drops below 1080p resolution on a base PS4 and maintain a 60fps frame rate throughout. We shipped version 1 of the game using Unreal 4.27.1, using physics for collision and client-side rigid body sims. I imagine that Unreal 5 and Chaos will be in our future at some point, but development has, of the game has stayed in UE4 as production began three and a half years ago before UE5's announcement. To give some context of our internal team size, uh, we peaked at 104 developers at our largest de uh, deployment, uh, plus many other people at the studio have uh, contributed indirectly to the game's development as well. And we have a number of valuable outsourcing partners in areas like concept and environment art, as well as testing, which can be difficult for a small team to do for a game that requires 40 players for a single match. All right, so here's an overview of what I want to be sharing with you today. Uh, I'm going to go over some high-level details on our environment, lighting, and character setup in Unreal, and then we're going to do a deep dive into some rendering optimizations we made to the engine. And we'll round things off with some tips on looking for problematic content. It's a broad range of topics, so let's get into it. Let's get things started by talking about our environment and level streaming. As a battle royale game, a large arena is an important pillar of the gameplay with the final rings randomized to different parts of the arena between matches. This means we have a lot of content that we need to manage at the visual target our artists and designers wanted to hit. This means splitting our content into streaming levels. Streaming levels are arbitrarily sized in Unreal, so we picked a few conventions to guide our development. The buildings, props, and foliage were split into their own levels with different streaming, le or streaming distances for each. All of these levels will be loaded at all times on our server, with the meshes and audio and other client-only assets stripped out, but the clients are gonna load and unload the full versions of these levels based on the current camera location on the client. Because these streaming levels have arbitrary bounds, we decided to organize them into a grid, and you can see the guide that our artists use for the placement here. Each cell is 10,000 units in each dimension. One nice thing about the arbitrary bounds is that we can break the rules whenever we need to. So we have important structures going to point of interest levels that may cross streaming level boundaries. You can see it's clear with the skyscraper in the lower left of this image and the cranes on the right side. 
While streaming levels can be set up by hand, we opted to use Unreal's world composition system. You can see here that the various levels in our medium-sized buildings layer are all set up to match the various zones the artists use to lay out the world. World composition is also important because the HLI generation tools in Unreal are built into it to generate merged LEDs for entire levels after they stream out. We typically have two LEDs on most of our levels. We also added version tags to the levels so we can control transitioning of development of them between our seasons. We also made some modifications for streaming performance as well. We pre-stream levels during cannon launch at the player's expected landing location. And you can see in this panel that we've exposed a priority up to our uh, content developers so they can assign more important levels like buildings or terrain to load in before props or VFX. We also modified the system to serialize the levels instead of looking them up dynamically. This is uh, an important change to world composition uh, because it allows us to use IO store or asyncloading2.cpp if you're familiar with the source code, uh, which is critical to us for streaming performance. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we light this environment. I think it's gonna be useful to break down the lighting components that contribute to the look. Here I have an interesting location that I think shows off the different features nicely. Uh, these are mostly stock UV4 features uh, with some tweaks, but there are a lot of different ways to do lighting in Unreal, so I think going over our setup is beneficial. Here I've stripped the shot down to just the main directional light with the shadows disabled. Uh, the background skybox is unlit, so it'll stay constant through all these shots. And here I've added the skylight component. You can see it brings a lot of lighting to the areas not directly hit by the sun. Our skylight does have some modifications. You can see in the details panel on the right side, that the artist can set our diffuse cube map separate from the specular cube map. We don't have any baked lighting enabled in the game, so the diffuse cube map is also compensating for a lack of proper global illumination. But we don't want that showing up uh, in our indirect specular lighting, as that will create uh, visual discontinuities and intensity between SSR traces and the cube map itself. For shadowing, we have three shadow cascades going out 8,000 units from the camera, which is actually not a very far distance. Pushing it farther creates uh, render thread performance challenges, though, and also strains our texel resolution on Xbox One, where shadow maps are gonna have less resolution to match the GP performance of the platform. So in the distance, past 8,000 units, uh, we use distance field shadowing. This means characters don't cast shadows at this distance, but really critically, it means that they receive the shadows from our buildings, which is important so they don't stick out and look like they're glowing. Similarly, we use distance field ambient occlusion um, on our skylighting to provide shadowing in our indirectly lit areas. You can learn more about distance field shadowing and ambient occlusion in Daniel Wright's talk, Dynamic Occlusion with Signed Distance Fields from SIGGRAPH 2015. Now, for all this to work well, we have to, uh, the artists have to manage these distance fields on our objects. Here are the per-object distance fields that the distance field shadows are traced against for this frame. And these per-object distance fields also get merged into a lower quality global distance field clip map that is traced against for the DFAO. Because these distance fields are of a volumetric data structure, they like small objects with minimal empty space in the volume, and it's good to reuse objects as much as possible to save space in the distance field atlas. To help this, we built our structures out of many smaller mesh components and grouped them into blueprints we call basic structures. Here you can see in the blueprint editor that this particular building has many components within it. Basic structures are set to go into clusters, much like uh, static mesh actors, which is critical for garbage collection performance on both the client and the server. Besides the benefits of the distance field data, mesh reuse means that we're able to heavily rely on instancing for rendering thread performance as well. Compatible meshes will dynamically merge into instance draws using UV4's GPU scene. Uh, this helps us with props and foliage. But these basic structures actually have a special instancing path that we developed. I'm gonna cover more in the optimization section of this presentation. But for now, let's shift gears and talk about our characters. Our systems team built out a very rich customization system for our characters. I wanna share a little about how we have them set up in UE4. The number of accessories supported on our characters makes keeping each as its own skeletal mesh component prohibitively expensive, even if animation cost for them is amortized with the master pose system. So what we did instead was we built on top of Unreal's skeletal mesh merge system, which creates a new single skeletal mesh component with each material getting its own slot. So what we have is a single vertex buffer that is being skinned, but the character renders each material separately in the renderer with its own index buffer. This is less optimal than if we forced a common material uh, on all of our accessories with texture arrays or texture atlases. Building a system like that 
would both be a larger undertaking and reduce the flexibility that keeping these separate materials allow in artist authoring. The process of building new vertex and index buffers for the combined mesh is still quite slow, though, and produces unacceptable spikes on the game thread if done synchronously when a character enters relevancy. This is usually going to be pre-matched on the barge that the players are loading into, but the barge is actually large enough that if you're opposite ends, you'll be outside of the relevancy distance. Additionally, we have modes like playground mode where players will load into different parts of the island directly, and that means that these hitches could occur during combat when you first encounter a player. Our solution was to move the merge to an async background task, which was really easy to do, but it also, like most th threading optimizations, uh, had some very nasty bugs. Uh, one especially painful issue was that uh, we accidentally let the reference count on the materials go to zero just while the async task was running, which would cause the garbage collector to delete the materials out from underneath it. It would only result in a crash if a GC began at exactly the same time as one of these mesh merges. This re uh, reproduced for about once a month for two years. But once all that was working, a completed mesh stays uh, cached by the client, even if a player leaves your relevancy range, because we don't allow changes to customization mid-match, which uh, simplifies that substantially. One advantage of the mesh merge process was that it merges identical materials into a single index buffer, which allows us to efficiently resolve needing to hide sections of skin on the base mesh when we need to resolve interpenetration issues or, and wasted rendering of hidden triangles. For example, if this character was wearing a jacket, we'd want to hide the parts underneath it. The skin is split into as many subsections by our artists, which they're able to override in the accessory system with a special empty material to signify that those indices should be discarded for that section of the skeletal mesh. You can see here that the left thigh maps to just slot three uh, on this character, uh, and all of these are gonna collapse into a single skin material in the final merged mesh with the uh, uh, relevant ones discarded. Uh, this also means that if you equip uh, accessories that have matching material instances, but maybe different base meshes, uh, they'll turn into a single draw call at merge time, so a pair of elbow pads will turn into a single material in the final mesh. All right, so I mentioned our performance target is 1080p, 1080p on uh, 60 FPS on a base PS4. Uh, we made a lot of engine optimizations to maximize our quality at that performance target. I'm gonna walk through a number of these changes targeted at rendering in the next few sections of this talk. But before getting too far into the details, I think I should start by giving some context to my personal philosophy on optimization. First and foremost, I think there's an optimization potential uh, anytime uh, a, g a game engine is not built from scratch for a particular game. It's always useful to reflect on how your specific content might allow the engine to be modified or configured to run what you're making most efficiently. Secondly, I have over time come to appreciate that calling out redundant or unneeded work on the GPU is something that I can go back to time and time again when looking for games. In the simplest sense, it's making sure that every wavefront running on the GPU is actually contributing to the final image that I care about. And finally, whenever I'm working on a 60 hertz video game, I generally use a tenth of a millisecond as my measuring stick for an, if an optimization is actually worth doing. Less than that, and I'll sit on that change as not being worth the risk of modifying the engine and the additional merge burden for when we upgrade engine versions. A tenth of a millisecond is often my sweet spot for feeling like a change is worthwhile, and enough of these tenth of a millisecond changes added together will eventually result in a big impact on the game. All right, on that note, I'd like to start by talking about our depth prepass configuration in UE4. Here I have a test level with 40 characters standing in front of me as a stress test for when lots of characters are nearby. This was one of the earliest tests we put together for the game, knowing that we were building a battle royale game and there may be at times many players nearby in a single area, especially with melee combat. And here's the depth prepass for that frame with standard settings in Unreal. The movable skeletal meshes are included in this prepass, but the prepass excludes objects with small screen size bounds and masked objects, as those are expected to be poor occluders, so the hair is being excluded from my character in the shot. Now, let's break down what this looks like in a razor trace from PS4. Uh, you can see that the characters are very vertex heavy, and the prepass takes half of a millisecond as a result, and the base pass takes 1.33 milliseconds. Uh, here I've simply changed our prepass on that observation uh, to exclude the movable objects. This means that only the floor is going into the prepass now in this test scene, expecting that the vertex heavy characters are not going to be a good value proposition. And here's the effect of the frame time in Razor. You can see that the prepass improved by half of a millisecond, and the base pass only increased by a tenth of a millisecond from the added overdraw. This is a trade off I'm very happy to make, and it's the type of tuning you like to explore for a given game's, for a, a given game's content and target platforms. However, 
using stock UE4, there's a competing case where this configuration is not going to work well for us. Consider this scene in the actual island map with a reasonable amount of foliage in front of our character. This prepass excludes the character and the mass materials as well, which is what we had configured previously. And here's the timing and eraser. The prepass only takes a third of a millisecond, but the base pass takes four milliseconds now. Notice there's a lot of pixel shading waves on the base pass. This is from the foliage overdraw. Using a mass material disables early Z on the GC and GPUs, which is what's happening in this base pass. However, there's a more optimal way to render the foliage. We prepass just a minimal depth, um, a minimal shader for the depth, which is gonna be the opacity mask pin in the material graph for these objects, and then use the depth equals mode in the base pass with a version of the shader with the discard instruction stripped out. This allows the more expensive base pass shader to avoid this overdraw. And UE4 has a flag that will just do this for you already, early Z pass only material masking. However, it's implemented such that it forces a full prepass, including the characters. And then every uh, draw in the base pass is gonna render with depth equals. And this is the effect in Razor with this full prepass. The prepass now takes 1.26 milliseconds, but the base pass is cut down to 2.2 milliseconds. This is a one millisecond improvement for the frame. But this also means that we just lost our previous test case of the characters um, and it's back to being four tenths of a millisecond slower in that test. In pursuit of having the renderer best fit our game's content, we modified UE4 so that early Z-pass only material masking forces mass materials to prepass, but not other meshes. And in the base pass, we only set depth equals for the mass draws. Here you can see the foliage is now in the prepass depth, as well as the character's hair, but the rest of their body is excluded, which is what we want. Here's the net result in Razor. The prepass in this case decreases by 0.07 milliseconds, and the base pass increases by 0.02 milliseconds. At 0.05 milliseconds, this wouldn't fit my measuring stick of a full tenth of a millisecond on its own, but recall this allows us to have our cake eat it too, as the character rendering test will see the full four tenths of a millisecond improvement that we were looking for. Similar in spirit to maximizing our value out of early Z in the prepass, I'd like to walk through our player occlusion and outline effect, which I worked with my colleague Corinne Lord to develop. Here's a shot where you can see both parts of this effect on my teammate, which makes them easily identifiable in a brawl with another team. A more subtle version of just the occlusion part of this effect also shows up on the main player, so that way you can always see the silhouette of your character even if an object passes between uh, the character and your camera. This effect was originally prototyped by the artist using UE4's custom depth feature and a post-process material draw, which is really easy to hook up. But there were a number of performance drawbacks for this. The custom depth buffer consumes additional memory and requires a full clear. And the characters must be rendered in extra time to it. Furthermore, the apply step runs as a full screen pass. We instead moved to setting stencil bits in the base pass and velocity pass, and then ran a custom shader in post-processing only on the pixels that we need. Note that there are a few small engine modifications that are needed to preserve these stencil bits throughout the entire frame, and we also had to reclaim some stencil bits from parts of the engine we were not using. Now, let's walk through the stenciling passes. Paying attention to the rendering of the pink shirt on my teammate, I'm showing the albedo here and the base pass to make it easy to spot. And here we are in Razor. You can see in this particular shot that the stencil bits are set and the shirt writes out 0x06 for the fragments that are passing the depth test. Then at the end of the base pass, you can see that the rest of the stencil bits are filled out uh, for the environment. The non-character stencil is set to 0x80, uh, and it gives a nice outline of the environment. This is from the receives decal being set, or the receives decal bit being set, which is not gonna be set on characters or the skybox. Then we also need to mark the fragments that failed the depth test so we get the full outline of the character. We handle this when the characters are rendering an additional time during velocity rendering. Stencil can be written on Z fail, which is what we're doing here. So early Z is handling writing these stencil locations into memory for us um, as the character is rendering uh, based off of Z fail, but it's launching the pixel shader waves for the ones that pass the depth test. So that way that still functions normally, writing out to the velocity buffer. The occluded part of the character is now hold 0x84 Note that any uh, characters that have this effect enabled must have their occlusion queries disabled on them or else they'll stop rendering entirely when they're fully occluded. This is only true of your team though, so the other teams will still occlusion call uh, like normal. Finally, the post process for this effect is run before TAA on the fragments the player is rendered to. The shader samples the neighboring pixels to render the outlines at the edge of the character and the center sample determines the player color and if the occlusion tint should be applied based off of the stencil uh, memory. 
The shader has to be run before TAA, or else the stencil positions will not be valid for the unjittered camera matrix after TAA. However, this is actually ideal, because TAA is gonna provide nice anti-aliasing on the effect. Because we only render to the inside of the character silhouette, we do not fight against the TAA algorithm as the outline effectively moves with the depth values of the character when they animate, and we get minimal tearing or ghosting as a result. To illustrate how efficient this is, here's a razor trace for that frame. You can see the occlusion effect only took 0.035 milliseconds to run, with very few pixel shader waves actually running. Only the pixels that actually have uh, the outline effect in them are, are gonna be processed. And here I've scrolled down to show that a large amount of this effect is spent with early Z rejecting based off of the stencil bits that have been set. We have not configured high stencil for this project, but theoretically this is actually a use case that would benefit from it. Uh, but the time is already so minimal for this draw, it's not really a priority. And enabling high stencil does have trade-off with high Z precision on GCN. All right, so I'd like to talk about reflections, and indirect specular, and subsurface which was a part of the engine that I found myself looking at quite a bit early on in the project as an area I thought I could improve. This is a particular stretch of frame time I found myself looking at. At 2.4 milliseconds, it's a pretty hefty amount of time on our little 16.6 .6 millisecond frame. Here's the scene that this trace is from. I'll revisit this in a bit, but it's a pretty standard frame for us. We have some foliage, a character, some sky, and there's some shiny metallic objects and a few reflective windows as well. Let's go back to that stretch of time in Razor with the wavefronts colored by batch now. This long section in the middle is the environment lighting applied pixel shader, clocking in at 1.2 milliseconds. Before that, screen space reflection tracing takes four tenths of a millisecond. And after that, we have eight tenths of a millisecond spent on subsurface scattering. If you're not familiar with subsur if you're not familiar, subsurface starts by clearing some UAVs and then runs something called subsurface setup, which is gonna do tile classification on whether or not to use the newer Burley subsurface model or the older uh, screen space subsurface uh, path. And then it dispatches compute shader batches for tiles based on the type. And then finally, there's a recombine with the frame buffer. The Burley model was added after our character look was developed, uh, and this tile classification was added later as well. Um, so we don't have any tiles falling into that path, um, but it still fits uh, the optimizations I'm gonna show. Okay, so mentioning tile classification on the subsurface is an interesting launching point into how I approached improving these systems. On Trier 4 presented a version of the tile classification technique for reducing their per tile cost of, of lighting in their talk, Deferred Lighting in Uncharted 4 from SIGGRAPH 2016. I thought that the heavy time spent on reflection apply could be optimized in a similar way. I wrote a tile classification shader that looked at the G-buffer properties of an eight by eight group of pixels and built lists based off of the materials that were present. Then each list can be rendered using dispatch indirect, uh, but with different shader permutations for each dispatch. Note that this requires setting the scene color to be bound as UAV, which is also not standard in UE4. So for example, in the frame that we're looking at, we can pretty clearly see that there's gonna be groupings of pixels that fall into either all default lit or all two-sided foliage. And here's a visualization of the tile classification running in practice. The green tiles fall into the default lit path, the blue is all foliage, and the red shading paths that you see on the edges or where the, the skin shader is present, those are the complex path. Those are just falling back to run the full shader. However, the most important thing that this work took me to that I didn't think about when I first started on it was that these unlit tiles up here where the skybox are, those tiles are gonna be cold entirely and not launch a wavefront, and they have the biggest impact on the running time. This got me thinking about how tile classification could get me, uh, or could be used for calling workloads from screen space reflections and subsurface scattering as well. So here's the updated plan. We'll call the unlit tiles from all the passes, and we'll add a classification for if tiles are too rough to trigger a screen space reflections trace, and we'll skip subsurface on tiles with no skin materials in them, and we can even run a simplified clear on the tiles that do need to be cleared, but don't need the full subsurface shader run, or full, subs full subsurface setup shader. I know looking at code is hard, but rest assured, this talk is being recorded and the slides will be available. So let's walk through a little bit of what is happening in the tile classify shader code. The classification happens on eight by eight tiles, but each group covers a 16 by 16 area because subsurface scattering is gonna be happening at half res. After sampling the gbuffer properties with get screen space data uint, I use wave ops to merge the bit masks for each eight by eight tile together. So all the threads were the same value after this merging. You can see that in the code, this is happening with the UE4 shader API commands, wave all bit or, and wave all bit and. 
after that, uh, the shader permutation for the tile is selected, uh, and the result is written out by just the first thread. An interlocked add occurs on the counts that gives a unique index for the tile that maps to our tile locations buffer. This holds the pixel location for a given tile on the screen, so it can be reconstructed later when we're actually rendering the effects. Finally, after four iterations of the eight by eight tiles are processed, the subsurface tiles are written out at half resolution and also a, a list for the clear tiles as well. It's worth noting one really great thing about this shader that's uh, analyzing our gbuffer, it all actually maps back to a single texture read. Epic has conveniently already packed all the relevant information into just gbuffer B that I'm showing here. Now, in the reflection apply shader, we take the tile permutations uh, that we've defined up in the C++ code, and we've interpreted the different, uh, uh, different permutation indexes into various macros that are used to strip out parts of the shader. Our compute shader path uh, for the tiles begins by using the group ID to look up into the tile locations buffer that I described, and then unpacking to an individual pixel location with the group thread ID. You can see here that after the gbuffer is read, uh, we perform an overwrite of the shading model ID. Uh, this allows the optimizer to perform dead code elimination and is just using the previously shown preprocessor macros. It's also important to note uh, that uh, we need to use the macros to skip parts of the SSR buffer uh, that were not processed. This is more important for correctness than performance in this particular shader, um, as tiles that were not run for screen space reflections are gonna have garbage data in them, as those aren't gonna get cleared ever. All right, so let's go over uh, in Razor on the CUs uh, what this actually means. Uh, and here's our starting point again for reference. And here's our new frame. The tiled reflection ply is in the middle again at 1.08 milliseconds. It's a 0.13 millisecond improvement. You can see the different colored batches from the different shader permutations. About half of this benefit is from calling sky pixels in the frame. So this really isn't worthwhile in frames that don't have any sky pixels if you're looking straight at the ground. Uh, one micro optimization I would point out is that I have the slower waves ordered, um, or I have the slower waves with lower occupancy ordered first after the initial barrier for the effect, and then I have the fastest waves ordered at the end. This helps reduce cracks between the batches that I believe can occur from the lower occupancy waves waiting for more registers to be available uh, when the faster waves are running. And it also results in faster draining of the work at the end as opposed to if you have a few longer running waves. While tiled reflection apply is just getting a small benefit, screen space reflections is actually seeing a huge benefit already, three tenths of a millisecond better. That's actually a conservative measurement because the waves are getting much better overlap with the DFAO history update as well. There's no need for a barrier in the typical frame between screen space reflections and DFAO history update because uh, the TAA history is going to be read in screen space reflections and not the current scene color unless a camera cut occurred. These results with screen space reflections are what gave me confidence initially that this was gonna be a win in the final version of the game. And then subsurface scattering also sees a huge benefit, six tenths of a millisecond better. You can see that the setup and tile clears are getting really nice overlap with each other, and the tile clears have much shorter waves than if they were running a full setup shader, which is what was happening originally. The blur steps are basically the same as the current uh, tile classify path in stock UV4. And the recombine is also very fast, as only the tiles with skin in them are run, which cuts down on the bandwidth substantially. This is a total savings of around one millisecond for this frame, although obviously those benefits will vary based on the scene composition. Of course, some of this benefit is offset by running the tile classify earlier in the frame. It can be run as soon as the decals are done modifying the G buffer. Here you can see it taking a minus 0.18 milliseconds on the PS4. You notice that the wave ops in this shader really nicely balance the SALU and VALU workloads compared to a lot of typical uh, wave fronts. Possibly this is the most balanced shader I've written in that regard during the entire GCN console generation. And we can improve it more. This classification job very nicely overlaps um, with shadow depth rendering using async compute. Here you can see it overlapping with some vertex shading work before pixel shading waves kick in for some mass materials. This is also frame dependent, but I generally see running in async save a tenth of a millisecond, which brings the cost of the classify down to around 0.08 milliseconds for each frame. All right, now it's time to really get into the weeds and talk about GPU-driven rendering. This means it's time to return to instance rendering of basic structure that I mentioned earlier in the talk. As discussed, having lots of small reused meshes is good for distance field quality and memory. 
but having very large numbers of mesh components drives up our primitive count on the render thread. While these primitives will be merged into smaller numbers of compatible draw calls by the GPU scene with dynamic instancing, each one has to go through calling and mark relevancy individually. My uh, colleague Nate Mefford tackled this problem during his time working on the project. I'm gonna walk you through the GPU-driven rendering system he developed to alleviate this pressure. I'm gonna use this shot as an example of a challenging view for us to render. There are lots of primitives making up these buildings that are close enough to be streamed in. Now, UE4 already has a system that can be used for reducing primitive counts. The Merge Actors menu allows us to convert all the static mesh components in a selection into, into instance static mesh components, which are gonna manually instance, ignoring the GPU scene, and render as a single primitive throughout the rendering pipeline. However, stock instance static mesh components have a number of drawbacks um, compared to using individual mesh components that are dynamically instancing. The first two are that GPU performance degrades. The larger bounds on the merged primitives means that a uh, more conservative uh, LOD will be selected for the entire group. And also, it's gonna degrade the calling result on a, a occlusion and frustum calling. It also places a lot of burden on our artists asking to do this fix up manually to convert to these new components. The Cadillac solution is to go down the path of a full GPU-driven renderer. We could issue just a small number of commands on the CPU and handle all the LOD selection and calling on the GPU. Sebastian Altonen pioneered a lot of these ideas in his part of the talk, GPU-driven rendering pipelines from SIGGRAPH 2015. I should note that many of these ideas were incorporated into Nanite's rendering system as well. But our little team before UE5 didn't have the resources to do a huge rewrite of the UE4 renderer. Instead, Nate found a really great compromise solution to go halfway and modify ISM component to render with a special ISM GPU scene. We convert compatible components on, on basic structure actors into ISM components at cook time, which keeps the burden off of our artists. We keep the ISMs grouped into their owning basic structures, so components that could have dynamically instanced between two neighboring buildings within a view no longer do so. But this is because buildings still offer a really nice unit of course CPU side LED selection and calling, which helps keep our GPU overhead low from uh, going down this path. When I say that course CPU LED selection is important, I mean that we can't just send one draw call per LED to the, um, to the GPU, as the command processor will get overloaded from too many empty batches in them with zero vertices. We have kept the now deprecated get custom LED path in place in our version of the engine in order to support reducing to a smaller min-max of LEDs so we can skip the draws that we know will be entirely empty. This is a CPU versus GPU balancing act and is one clear area where a full GPU-driven rendering pipeline would allow us bigger gains. Now, before I get into more implementation details, here are the performance numbers for the test frame I showed with all the structures rendering with individual mesh components. I'm showing the two most relevant counters from stat unit in the lower left. The render thread is sitting at 13.5 milliseconds and the GPU at 15 milliseconds. And here is the same shot with GPU-driven ISM components enabled. GPU time stays relatively constant, but render thread time improves by a whopping 2.7 milliseconds. So let me walk you through a few of the important steps in our implementation. Here is the code in the basic structure class that we have that converts our individual mesh components to ISM components. First, we iterate all of the components and build a unique mapping to the source meshes. Uh, then we filter out some incompatible meshes at this time as well uh, that aren't gonna be compatible with our instancing system. Then we iterate over the instances for each mesh and build our ISMs. Note that like many things in computer graphics, handling negative scale and non-uniform scale was a particular sore spot for getting everything to render correctly between both paths. Nate has some really informative comments here about uh, the issues that he was resolving. Then the instances are added to a new ISM component and the old components are destroyed. And finally, the new component is registered after we're done processing the instances. We do this in the class's serialized function, but some of my more recent work has made me believe it would actually be more correct to handle this type of operation on pre-save as we are destroying and adding new components. The ISM component proxy code has a key modification in that we bind an instance ID and direction buffer. Regular old ISMs will just access zero to N instance ID sequentially. To continue supporting this, our indirection buffer sets up a number of sequential IDs at the front of the memory. This code path is still important to us for grass rendering in particular, which go through the, the hierarchical, hierarchical instance static mesh component path. But any ISMs using our new GPU scene are gonna instead read their IDs from the portion beyond this point in the buffer, and that area is dynamically updated once a frame uh, by our scene update compute shader. And here is that shader. Each ISM component gets assigned a single uh, group, which is the size of one wavefront. 
and this allocates space into the ID buffer. This is done atomically as multiple groups are gonna be in flight at once. Then some LDS is cleared to track our indirect args with the counts for each mesh, uh, and a barrier is inserted. After this point, uh, we loop over the instances and perform our LED selection. The appropriate indirect arg counter in LDS is atomically incremented, and the instance ID is written out to the indirection buffer. You might notice that this has a lot of similarities to the tile locations buffer from the tile classification code I described previously. While the first view holds all the instances for a given instance static mesh, we also perform per view calling on our main and shadow cascade views to further reduce wasted verts where possible. Finally, we have one more barrier, and we write the indirect args from LDS out into main memory. The shader is generally pretty fast to run. In this frame, it only took 0.07 milliseconds. We also have to handle scattered updates of the mesh data whenever a new ISM component uh, is added to the scene, but that is not a per frame operation, and it just runs using a variation of F scatter copy read write buffer to handle patching the relevant data. I'm very happy with the results of this system. We have a few ideas for further improvements. Merging of loose static mesh actors could help improve prop rendering. And the system is currently only doing uh, occlusion calling on the bounds of a full structure. So some form of per instance occlusion calling could be beneficial to us as well. Finally, one important topic that I wanna cover in this presentation are some of the strategies I use in UE4 to look at our content and help our artists stay on top of things. When you're working on a project with a lot of content flowing into it, this can be critical. I've listed some of my favorite logging commands in UE4 here. I'd like to elaborate on, on a couple of the ones I use the most. I know this information is documented elsewhere for the engine, but I started using each of these largely from seeing them in presentations like this one. So hopefully you'll learn about some unreal features that could make your life easier. I'm gonna go through a few of these in more detail, but I recommend checking out each of these commands on your own projects if you are unfamiliar. The first is that sometimes I like to go to different parts of the game and just dump what's in the texture pool with less textures and less textures dash non-streaming. The textures that are currently loaded can tell a lot of interesting stories about the game and engine that I may have not realized previously. For example, I didn't know that decal components don't hook into texture streaming by default, and having lots of decals can quickly gobble up texture pool space unless you make some changes. Or that the main menu for us wasn't getting unloaded when entering the game. This was due to hard references in the UI code that needed to be changed to weak pointers so that the garbage collector could work properly. Or even just maybe a new artist joined the project fresh out of school and didn't know that I really wanted all of the world textures to be power of two and block compressed at all times. There's also analogous commands for list static meshes and list skeletal meshes that can be useful in the right context. List static meshes in particular has a really cool mode that got added relatively late in the UE4 lifecycle. Adding the dash use components option will cause each mesh to identify the components that reference them. This can help you identify why a particular mesh didn't stream out. And the meshes with, with few instances may be better targets for unloading than a mesh that was used frequently. And conversely, a mesh that is used frequently is probably a better target for vertex and material optimization. While listing textures and meshes are great from a rendering perspective, Objlist tells a story of the whole scene, giving data on every U object that's currently present. This can tell information about object counts and a partial view into memory usage, although not as of much of a full story as something like the memory profiler in Unreal Insights. It's a great starting point for many memory optimizations. You can also drill into a particular type of class similar to how we were able to do so with dash use components on list static meshes by adding the dash class equals and a class name uh, to the options for the command. Here I'm using it to filter to just body setup class. This tells me information about the collision data on our physics bodies. This particular command once helped me identify that all of our imposters out in the horizon of the world had collision data enabled on them, which was, they're always loaded, but they're never reachable by any of our players. It's really easy to fix this just by uh, setting those assets to no collision. It's finding them that's the hard part. Complementing objects is the objects command, which identifies the paths through the reference collector to the objects. This can help you figure out why garbage collect ultimately did not clean up a particular object. I mentioned our problems with the main menu not unloading earlier. Objects was essential for helping identify our problems there. GC clustering makes this more complicated to figure out, and the GC commands I included on the earlier slide can help you understand how your clusters are behaving if, like us, you have clustering enabled for GC performance. Now, finally, up in the editor, you may not know that there is an advanced search syntax that can be very helpful for reviewing assets based on their asset metadata. 
Here I'm searching for accessory albedo textures that are DXT5 compressed instead of BC7 compressed. BC7 is the same amount of memory but higher quality. Adding the unknown format will cache assets that are not currently uh, cooked by the editor as it does lazy cooking to keep load time slow, uh, faster. You can select all of the results that were found and then right click on those assets. It can be a slow operation but it'll force the editor to cook everything you've selected and then all of the unknown results will be removed from, from the, the final results. Here's a similar uh, search that I used recently that's, uh, that I think is really great. I'm looking for static meshes in this case, specifically ones that have more than 200 vertices in them but don't have any LEDs set on the base mesh. These are a prime candidate for having the artist go in and adjusting the LEDs on them. All right, so I wanna be sure I, I thank everyone that contributed to this work, especially Corinne Lorick, Nate Mefford, Rusty Swain, David Lasky, and our partners at Dragon's Lake for the direct contributions to the rendering code on the project. I also wanna thank our wonderful art team for making the game look great and collaborating with us to make sure it always stays performant, and the Rumbleverse team leadership, especially Ramon Franco, Alicia Kano, and Lars DeVore. And finally, of course, my wonderful family for always being so supportive, Kelsey, Spaceman, and Nova. I've got references where relevant, and I believe we have nine minutes for Q&A.
about that.
I'm ready. This is The Girl with the Pearl Earrings by Jones Vermeer. It's not entirely known who the subject of this painting is. Some believe maybe he's Vermeer's daughter. Maybe she was his mistress. This painting hangs in The Hague and it's very famous. Vermeer was never really famous while he was alive, and his fame came after his death. But it's known as the Mona Lisa of the North, and it became quite famous. It's very alluring, her gaze, the part of her lips. Diego Velazquez painted this painting in 1650, and this was during his life, his slave, but he became a famous painter in his own right and painted many famous paintings himself. Many people know this painting by Gilbert Stuart, painted in 1796, of course, of George Washington And of course, the Mona Lisa. It is said this painting is viewed 10.2 million times a year. And it's one of the most famous paintings in the world. It is said this painting hung in Napoleon's bedroom at one point. And of course, there's a lot of amazing history so many things have been said about this painting. And part of the reason that I bring these up is because for the longest time, if you wanted paintings, if you wanted likenesses of anyone, particularly portraits, the 15, 16, 1700s, you had drawing rooms or you had dining rooms, particularly for the rich, and the walls adorned with images of people that you knew, family members. And this is how you remembered people, right? And this is really important until, of course, in 1826, when Joseph Nips created the first photograph. And this is his first photograph, which he took outside of his bedroom. It's a heliograph. And it was done on a pewter plate. And it took days for this image to process. And you can tell because the light actually changes on the buildings. And it was a very primitive image. And at the time, his partner, Louis Daguerre, took the work that he did, and he invented what came to be known as the daguerreotype, right? And the daguerreotype became a really important piece of hardware. Now, when the daguerreotype was invented in the mid-1800s, he kind of open sourced the technology to the world, to everyone, of course, except for the English. Because the French and the English didn't get along very well. 
But the daguerreotype is a, a really amazing piece of technology. Um, every image that was made by the daguerreotype was a one-off. Uh, and it was a very volatile process. But what we were able to do with the daguerreotype back then was really fascinating because in the mid-1800s, we were able to capture images of people, of course, like Abraham Lincoln when he was still running for Congress. And the image to the right is of Jesse James when he was five years old. And of course, people like Frederick Douglass and Theodore Roosevelt in his early 20s. And so you take this concept of highly skilled artists that it took to paint portraits like the Mona Lisa or the lady with the pearl earrings and you start to expand on the ability to create many more images or capture family members and have albums full of your ancestors. But it was still a complicated process. This is potentially the very first selfie taken in 1839 of Robert Cornelius. But even back then, it was a highly skilled process. Photographers in the 1800s had to bring their photo labs with them, and they were able to do amazing things. They could travel and take, you know, during the Civil War and during that time, hundreds if not thousands of images and process them in their covered wagons with highly volatile chemicals. But it wasn't even until 1901 that Eastman Kodak brought really photography to the masses with the Brownie camera. And back then it sold for a dollar, which is equivalent of $33 in 2001. And it came preloaded with 100 negatives in essence. And you'd take 100 pictures and you'd send it to the Eastman factory and they would return your images to you and reload the camera. It was originally marketed to children. And there were multiple generations of this camera that evolved quite rapidly and was used for many years and took a lot of amazing images and created a lot of history. These types of cameras allowed us to capture images of people like Mark Twain and Pablo Picasso. And of course, many historic figures like Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla, Marilyn Monroe, and of course, luminary figures like John Fitzgerald Kennedy. But really, this ability to capture these images started to become something that didn't require the expertise of a portrait painter or even a photographer that had to have all that equipment on a covered wagon and started to democratize the process. Cameras became an enabling technology, a game-changing technology that helped us to realize that it became more about the content that's what we really wanted. It wasn't so much about drawing rooms. We just wanted images. We wanted more and more images. And digital photography became something that even enabled us more in 1975. Digital photography was invented, but it wasn't until the 1990s that it became even much more of a reality in the 2000s that mobile phones and mobile devices really made digital photography a reality for us. And the transformative technology of mobile phones really changed the game for everyone. And now we've got the power and ability to use a mobile phone to have thousands and thousands of images. So you take that concept 
you know, of the Mona Lisa and the skill it takes to do that. And then the people that were traveling and taking images, you know, at great risk to themselves with the chemicals it took to process photos. So what we do, I don't know how many of you traveled on an airplane or in public transportation, you know, but how many people do we see taking selfies of themselves? Not just young people, but everyone, right? Like, this is something that we all do in many cases. To the point where you can't go to a public venue without the mobile phone being a part of the process, being a part of what we want. We want the content. We want, you know, sometimes I'm surprised when I go someplace and people aren't really engaged in what they're there to participate in because they're so, you know, entrapped in their device, trying to capture it and preserve it for themselves. And it comes to the point where our mobile devices you know, have gigabytes and gigabytes of this content because that's really what becomes important. It's that content. It's, it's what we're after in many cases to the point where there have been entire industries that have evolved where now our photo albums are online. They're in the clouds with Instagram and TikTok and Twitter, right? Because that's what we're after. And it's really fascinating that having a smartphone capable of taking pictures at a moment's notice has drastically changed the way that people see the world and the events of the world, both good and bad. Because it's the ability to capture this content, it's the ability to participate and be involved that really matters to us. And it's that transformative technology that has enabled all of us to participate in one way or another. And that's what I want to talk about to a certain degree because it's happening again and we all get to participate in it. So that was my introduction to this talk today. My name is Louis Cataldi. Uh, I'm the education lead for Quixel. Uh, I've been part of Epic for eight years. I spent six of those years teaching Unreal Engine all over the world. Prior to being uh, a part of Epic, I spent seven years in television production. I worked at Blue Sky Studios, making films like Ice Age and Robots. Uh, I worked in video games, making my own video games. And I taught college for many years. But I want to talk about other types of technologies that have been massive game changers, similar to photography. Many of you hopefully have seen amazing films like the animated Tarzan by Disney, where you've got these amazing animators like Glenn Keane, and these are some of his animation tests for Tarzan. Once again, highly skilled individuals, frame by frame, drew these images of Tarzan. And that hasn't gone away, right? There's still these wonderful films that are produced, of course, like Toy Story and Frozen, where animators are still hand keying these wonderful works of art. I, I was privileged to work with many of them at Blue Sky on films like Ice Age. But that type of art form has evolved, right? There are also films like Planet of the Apes, where the sheer idea of being able to animate this volume of work would be very difficult, if not impossible, to do by hand. Because that many characters animating their bodies, their face, every bit of it could potentially be impossible. So motion capture is used to capture every subtle nuance. And it doesn't devalue the hand keying. It just amplifies it. It amplifies the volume. And so in many ways, like 
prior to the development of photography, those who wanted to capture images of individuals required a high degree of skill. Photography became an enormous game changer for the overall goal of sharing content. Animation sort of had a similar trajectory. And it's because of the appetite that we have for content that technology has to evolve and change in transformative ways so that we can meet this demand. So what are the next big game-changing technologies? What is going to change the game next? Well, of course, some believe that the metaverse is somehow going to be involved in many game-changing technologies. Though it's unclear, and many of the sessions this week are going to discuss it, it's believed that real-time 3D will be the foundation of the metaverse, and that high-quality 3D content will be part of it in one way or another. And it's suspected that it'll be filled with graphically rich world, teeming with life. Well, that poses significant challenges, right? So that presents many opportunities for us to change the game in another way. But that's really complicated because building worlds is hard and it's expensive, it's time consuming. And I know this is a dense slide with lots of words, words, but you know the significant amount of content it takes to build 3D worlds usually requires lots of crafting of 3D assets, and those can be very time consuming. Uh, as probably many of you know, quality control tends to be an issue. Reference material tends to be an issue. Uh, objects can be very difficult to source and craft and so forth. So what does this all mean? Uh, how do we solve for these challenges? How do we solve for these equations? Well, I work for a company called Quixel, right? And for the last dozen or so years, Quixel has been helping to prove that photogrammetry is a big part of this game-changing technology and that Quixel has been helping to solve for the appetite and the hunger of the industry for content. And so, for those of you who are not familiar with Quixel, let me show you a little movie that kind of shows a little bit of the trajectory of what Quixel has been up to. And if you turn the volume up,
So Quicksoil has become part of Epic, as you can see from this video. And for those of you who are not aware, and Quicksoil has a, a massive library of content that we've built and accumulated over the past dozen or so years, and it's growing and building slowly, and it's available to anyone working inside of the engine. And that is something that we continue to build and grow. But the point of this talk, yes, is that it's available, but what we're heading to is your participation in photogrammetry because like the fact that before it required everyone to go to a dedicated portrait painter or photographer to go and make photographs for you and then we evolved to the point where we all now have the ability to take thousands and thousands of images realistically we all need to participate if we're going to head to this future uh, that we're working towards because really content is king. We already see it to a certain degree. Those of you working inside of Unreal Engine hopefully have already jumped in and realized that Megascans is already inside of Unreal Engine and you can drag and drop all this stuff already inside of all your scenes and access, you know, to to a certain degree, 16, 17, 18,000 assets. But to a certain degree, we've become an enabling technology. Reality capture has been integrated in an integral part of Megascans since its inception. And reality capture is how we process all the content that we scan, right? The process of photogrammetry requires us to take in some cases, hundreds if not thousands of images of any particular subject, and that turns it into 3D. And yes, like a portrait painter, that required a significant amount of skill for the longest time, but the delta is shifting. It's becoming a lot easier to do all these things, and the equipment is becoming much more accessible to everyone. And at the end of the day, Nobody cares about all that stuff. What we really want is this stuff, just like we want the images, right? And that's the point. I am the director of the LA Lab for Epic Games. And we've recently set up an LED volume for R&D and demonstrations and generally um, for the ability to bring the community in and share all of the things that are related to the use of Unreal Engine in virtual production. So one of the first things that we've looked at is the development of content for an LED wall. And something that Megascans has done to help democratize the process is to scan huge numbers of locations and to prep that data for use on stages and accelerate the adoption of this type of production workflow throughout the industry. And I, I think one of the most valuable things that Quixel has done is to create a library of content that is accessible to anyone who's interested in implementing this in their production workflow. I think when people begin to explore this type of workflow, one of the things that isn't apparent at the beginning is the amount of time and energy and cost that goes into the creation of content. And I think what Megascans has done is to accelerate that and to also make the content available to anyone who wants to use it. I play that for you because, you know, at the end of the day, we just want to get to work, right? Um, I like to cook. I imagine some of you all like to cook. There are many people that like to go from raw ingredient, right? If you make a lasagna and you want to make your pasta, but you don't want to go out and milk the cow and make the cheese too, right? Uh, some people do. But sometimes you just want to eat some lasagna, right? And so... We want to get to the content. We want to get to what we're doing. And so uh, there's different degrees of how much you want to get involved in the process. 
Um, we've developed a lot of content. We've put a lot of it together. But you can get involved in many places of where you want. Let me share another clip from Eric Ramberg, our content director. My name is Eric Ramberg. I'm the content director here at Quixel. For any future in the metaverse, it's probably going to revolve around content. Um, and to fill that need um, and to hit that quality bar, we feel like we, we need to educate people on how we do it and how they can do it. And the, in the way technology uh, develops, in the, in the pace technology develops right now, in a couple of years you will have uh, a camera in your phone good enough to scan and, and create quality on, on the same level of what Megascans is today. Um, so the metaverse will be filled with content that, that you create for yourself as opposed to buying it off a marketplace or waiting for someone else to create it or, or part of a, some kind of experience. So to be able to fill the metaverse with uh, the, your content is probably going to be very important if you want to spend time there. I mean, the advantage of traditionally created 3D content is the, the level of control and, you know, to have procedural control over it. And the advantage of scanning and photogrammetry is the, the quality. So if you can combine the two, you have the quality of, of scanning, uh, but you have the control of procedural. Uh, that will be the, the perfect hybrid. And that is definitely how worlds are going to be created in the future. You don't want to be, you don't, you don't want to scan every single rock of a biome. You want to capture the flavor of the rock and then procedurally detail that environment with that flavor. And um, uh, that's, how our in, that's the direction our content will grow in the future. So what's I think really important to, to point out is that prior to Quixel joining Epic, no one had really ever seen Quixel scan anything. Our hardware was a highly guarded secret. Our process was a highly guarded secret. But once Quixel became part of Epic, there was no need for it to be a secret anymore. As a matter of fact, it became our mission to share these processes and to begin to share this hardware. As a matter of fact, one of my jobs is to teach the world how to do what we do and to prepare this material for public consumption in many ways. So what I'm about to share with you is a trailer to material that is being prepared uh, for public consumption. Uh, it's a multi-hour documentary series about how Quixel does what it does. And it's taking us a while because it was begun during quarantine, but it's on its way. Let me share it with you now. There's a lot of big challenges in making a video game. There always have been. And they've changed over the years, but the issue these days is scale. Being able to produce the amount of content that you require for some of these big games is the ball game. The goal of Quixel is to scan the world, and our job is to break it down. So we have to scan the things that are the essentials to build the world. In the early days of experimenting with photogrammetry and scanning, some of the early scenes that we built just blew our minds. We were able to build some of the coolest looking scenes. You're really showing what's in real life and it looks good. It just works. Something that Megascans has done to help democratize the process is to scan huge numbers of locations. We have this amazing rock here, which is super iconic. That would be extremely good to capture, but obviously that would be a very, very tricky asset to scan. So we need to assess, is it possible or not? It looks doable. It really doesn't matter if you have just a simple phone or a really, really advanced camera. The better resolution, the better scan. But essentially, taking a picture is all that matters. The techniques that Quixel developed in terms of how they scout, plan, break down a shoot into components, the way they photograph it is, is like super precise. This company is not just about making a bunch of photograms, it's about a discipline and a passion for making photoreal assets that are at the pinnacle of what you can do in a computer today. With Quixel, what we're able to do these days is to provide a library of some of this content of the standard that you may not even have the ability to make yourself inside your company. And having all of this stuff available is a game changer. 
This gives you a capability that you just simply have never had. It's an amazing resource, it's an incredible resource. For any future in the metaverse, it's probably going to revolve around content. And to fill that need and to hit that quality bar, we need to educate people on how we do it and how they can do it. That will be the perfect hybrid. And that is definitely how worlds are going to be created in the future. These tools are no longer just for the people who have kind of focused their entire career on this. Everyone is going to be able to do this. And as we start to see Quixel bringing these tools into the market and letting anybody use them anyway, everyone is going to be able to play together to tell a better story. As we build out this foundational library and as we create the tools that allow just about anyone to build the worlds of their imagination, it's only then it becomes truly accessible to all of humanity. We're really excited about uh, being able to share this information and this material because it um, you know, it's been a long time in the making. It's been a long time to be able to share the, the, the journeys of these individuals uh, that go out there in you know, the freezing cold and deep into the woods and, um, and take you know, this equipment out there. But I think the other part of it is because the trajectory, you know, just like I shared at the beginning of this presentation of you know, taking that covered wagon out there you know, with volatile chemicals and then I think as I project in the future it's not going to require all of that because the game-changing scanning technology is evolving as well you know uh, that's not just a model that's Elvira. Elvira is one of our scanning leads on the Quixel team and we've been experimenting with being able to scan with a mobile device and it's coming right uh, we've been strapping this really complicated, heavy-duty hardware on our backs and, you know, holding it out there, but it's all going to change. It's going to change as the hardware evolves. Reality scan, which you can go downstairs, experiment and test with, uh, is going to help democratize photogrammetry by putting this game-changing technologies in the hands of everyone for free. And I know it seems hard to believe to a certain degree you know, considering the amount of time and effort we've spent on developing proprietary hardware, but because of our partnership and collaboration with Reality Capture, we've done some tests. Uh, take a look. Uh, maybe you've seen this already on YouTube. that are available for iOS and Android. But we have taken Reality Scan out into the field. I've been testing it. This is a bunch of scans that I've done for myself. Uh, and I put them in uh, an actual scene in Unreal Engine 5 with a bunch of mega scan assets. And we've actually gone out in the field. This is Elvira, the model that you see. And she's one of our scanning leads. And there she is with a Quixel flash scanner. And you can see the, the size variation. And there she is out there scanning one-to-one -one assets with a flash scanner and reality scan. Uh, we hope to release this before the end of the year. It's still in heavy-duty testing. And here's what you can see that is actually the output of reality scan in Unreal Engine 5. What I'm going to show you now is an actual scene put together by one of our lead artists, an assembly of a bunch of reality scan assets in Unreal Engine 5 with that scene in the background uh, from one of our recent shoots in Sweden. And uh, he just kind of put this together as a test. All of these assets are nanite quality meshes. He used 
the tools inside of Unreal Engine to massage them and manipulate them and then built it around uh, an environment around them with existing Megascans assets. So to put reality scan next to, mega, next to Megascans is, can be risky, but they looked amazing. So the future is coming. It's coming in, and part of it is everyone can participate, just like everyone can participate or could participate when the evolution came of the daguerreotype all the way to mobile devices. It took 150 years in the past. I don't think it'll take that long moving forward. And it's already happening. There are already hundreds of people participating. I subscribe to people on Sketchfab who scan every single day. There are people posting free photogrammetry assets every single day on Sketchfab, and libraries are growing by the hundreds of assets that are available uh, for use in any number of projects. So my encouragement is for you all to start opening your awareness if you haven't already. And it's not just world objects. Uh, one of the cool things that I did very early on with early alpha and betas of reality scan is I scanned myself, right? So this is a scan of myself. My wife actually took some pictures uh, because I wanted to test reality scan with MetaHuman, uh, the mesh to MetaHuman creator. And I created a quick MetaHuman, and this process took less than an hour to create my version of, of mesh to MetaHuman uh, using reality scan. So that's my MetaHuman. I got to this point in less than an hour using that scan. Not perfect, but also for less than an hour's work, not terrible either. So this is kind of remarkable um, that we can do this kind of thing quickly and get to a mesh to MetaHuman. My name is Miles Perkins, and uh, I am the industry manager um, uh, for the m and &E business unit. I think as we start to have these tools um, for scanning um, and digitizing, um, these tools are, are no longer just for the people who um, have kind of focused their entire career on this, but we're starting to see that, you know, with a mobile device or with a set of cameras or you know, things that are handheld and are relatively easy to use, everyone is going to be able to do this, right? Everyone will be able to scan whatever uh, assets or whatever props that are in their proximity. Um, I think that, that as we start to introduce these, it's, it's going to be a natural part of the set designer. It's going to be a natural part of the art director there's going to be no difference between actually going to the prop shop and also picking up the, the, the virtual uh, uh, prop as well, and that you know that you'll have both of these um, that'll be there. I think that we're right now on the precipice of this happening. And as we start to see, you know, Quixel and the team there and capturing reality, um, bringing these tools uh, into the market, and letting anybody use them any way, I, that really does allow for each one of the different departments um, to participate. Miles speaks truth. Uh, you've seen him speak. He's the man. One Having testimony. been part of Epic for some time now and gaining deep insight into the needs of many different industries, not only games, films, but also architectural visualization, simulation, uh, automotive, product visualization, and well beyond. It's becoming clearer than ever that the demand for digital content is immense. And so it's imperative that we meet that demand and that we truly build a library that is at the scale that meets all of these demands. And this is why it's so incredibly important to open up about how to create content of this level of quality that is required 
by all of these different verticals so that we can work together well beyond the capacity of our own relatively small team to capture and process everything that is really needed to create the foundational layer of the metaverse. I've been sharing the takeaway from my talk today for pretty much the whole time I've been up here. So just to reiterate though, I think the trajectory that I wanna just make sure that you are all aware is that it's not the future, it's the present that I'm talking about, where this technology is coming to the devices in your pocket. Um, it's coming in months in many cases. And really participation isn't gonna require you to become an expert in photogrammetry. I think there's things that you will want to learn just like making a better lasagna, right? And so I encourage you all to, to jump in if you are interested in building worlds um, it's, it's a good time uh, because realistically it's not going to take too long in the future before our phones are filled with gigabytes and gigabytes and thousands of things that we've captured around us because we want them in our digital worlds and it will not require tremendous expertise. We just want to do it and I think that's the key takeaway that I have. I've been Louis Cataldi. And I thank you for your time. I believe there's a few minutes left for questions. Eight minutes.
All right. Oh, look, my mic is on. Okay, so looks like we're gonna get ready to get started. So greetings, everybody. My name is Sam Deiter. Um, I've got to stand a little bit away from the uh, the speaker over here. So, and uh, my name is Sam Deiter, and this is Building Open Worlds in Unreal Engine 5. So, and today's talk, we're gonna be covering the following outlines. We're gonna talk about open world overview. This is gonna go over just the tools, their names, right in the beginning so that we know kind of what we're talking about through the rest of the presentation. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the open world template. This is a template map that is provided for you inside of Unreal Engine 5 that allows you to automatically get started working building a massive open world. You don't really need to set anything up, so we'll go over that. Then we're gonna talk about each of the open world tools individually. This is gonna be like HLODs, data layers, um, the world partition editor, those are all the ones I can think of off the top of my head. And then finally, we will follow up with some open world debug commands to finish everything out. So, let's go ahead and jump in now to our open world overview. And the first thing that we're gonna be talking about is the big picture of all the tools. So the first tool, um, or to say the first portion of this that I wanna talk about is when you're crafting massive open worlds, you're gonna need to use all of these tools. Now there are two tools that are missing from this particular list because they're a little bit outside the scope of this. This is mass entities and smart objects. Those are for handling AI. All the stuff here though is for building your world. So first on the list, we have world partition. Now world partition is an automatic data management and distance based level streaming system that allows you to grid up your world and then stream those particular grid sections and the content within them based off where the user is in the world. We'll cover that in a lot more detail in just a little bit. Uh, we then have our one file per actor. What this is for is to help reduce the overlap between people who are working on the same project. Um, as many of you know, when you're working on an Unreal project, you have the UMAP file, which is your level file. And this can be kind of a production bottleneck, right? When you have multiple artists working on a massive world, only one artist can have that UMAP file checked out at one time, and this presents a bottleneck. This one file per actor helps to alleviate these by allowing basically every single actor in your project to become a file. So if you have that directional light there, that directional light is now a file that you can check in and out of per force. So you can check it in and out of source control. And that is for everything that's gonna be placed inside of your level. Again, what this really does is it allows people to not have to work over the top of one another or constantly ping somebody to check something in or to update something so that you can go ahead and free yourself up for, so that you can start working. We then have, and my notes list is a little messed up, but we're gonna talk about HLOD. Um, HLOD is a hierarchical level of detail and what this does is this allows you to basically process your entire world, bake a, um, either a new version of geometry that's off in the distance with either, like I said, new geometry, new textures, or you can merge them all together into an instant static mesh and does this for you all programmatically. So what it, this does is it helps those really, really, really far things off in the distance still look like they should, but you don't have the massive memory overhead that it would require to draw all of those objects. It's gonna do it for you all programmatically. Uh, excuse me. All right. Let's now talk about virtual shadows. So, one second here. It looks like my notes are messed up here. So uh, basically, virtual shadows, what they allow you to do inside of your scene is they allow you to get really, really awesome far distance shadows, or you get really, really fantastic shadows up very, very close to objects. Um, if you kind of look at shadowing in Unreal Engine 4, you notice that when you have an object have a shadow cast onto it, when that, uh, when you look at that object very closely, you'll notice there'll be some shadow acne or the shadows just won't be as precise as you want them. And no, no amount of shadow sharpening or uh, shadow bias filtering will kind of bring those shadows back to their nice crisp state. Virtual shadow maps help, oh, I'm sorry, virtual shadows, not shadow maps, virtual shadows help alleviate these problems by giving you very, very nice 
shadows very close up, but also giving you shadows very, very far away in the distance. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about each one of these tools in detail in just a little while. All right, let me just pop back up here to level instancing. So um, level instancing is still similar uh, to how our old, old level workflow used to be. However, you don't, you don't necessarily have to use levels in the strict sense of this one area is level one or this one area is level two. You can use levels to actually spawn other levels inside of them. So for example, you could have a level that contains the foundation of a building, spawn that in in multiple locations, which is actually something that is new to Unreal Engine 5. You didn't used to be able to spawn multiple levels inside of a level. So you can actually, with level instancing, set up your uh, projects so that each one of your buildings or vehicles or uh, whatever you're having to build in the world, you can have a level that acts as a foundation that you can then put other levels on top of and start to kit bash these things together to build these massive open worlds that uh, don't necessarily have to be built out of one single level instance. And this is really, really powerful because this means that you can go in and you can modify content in one area and then have it amplify all across your entire content pipeline. So I can make a change in one location and with level instancing have that go all the way through my entire pipeline without me having to go through and actually change all of that data throughout the entire, uh, the entire project. So the next thing I wanna talk about is data layers. Now data layers are a system within world partition that is used for organizing data, but the cool thing about data layers is you can use them both inside of the editor as a way to manage data, but you can also use them inside of your running project to turn things on and off. A really good example of this is in the Matrix Awakens demo. All of the uh, tops of the buildings are done as data layers so that they can then be turned off when the game is run on Xbox and uh, PS4 um, because that was a little bit of extra data that they couldn't really keep to maintain, but we wanna make sure that we have an experience that is the same across multiple platforms. And again, data layers, what they allow us to do is they allow us to tag different data, put it on that layer, and we can then use them either as an organizational layer inside of the editor or as a way to help reduce complexity at runtime. All right, so next we have virtual textures. Now, Virtual textures in the sense of the open world tools are only required when you wanna build your mini map. So the open world tools are going to provide you with a mini map, and in order to get that to draw, you will need to enable virtual texturing. Um, virtual texturing, I don't wanna get too far into the weeds on it because it's a very big topic into itself, um, but one of the big benefits of virtual texturing with the massive open worlds is that when, uh, when you go to draw an object, even if you can see one single pixel of that particular piece with the old style of rendering, you'd have to render all of the content that's associated with it. So let's say that we're building a big mountain range, right? And all we can see is one pixel of that mountain range. The rest of it happens to be included by something else. In our old system, without using virtual textures, we'd have to draw that entire object. Introducing virtual textures, it allows us to quad things up, now we only have to draw that one little pixel. Now, this is a great oversimplification of it, but that's one of the advantages of it is it allows us to have more content, but only draw the content that we actually need to see at any one given time. And the last uh, object, or last entry on this list is Nanite. Um, and although you don't need to use Nanite to build these massive open worlds, Nanite does help because it works with both virtual textures and virtual shadow maps, and it's really gonna help drive the quality home, right? Using uh, Nanite is really what's gonna help get these really, really fantastic looking scenes that have a lot of depth and a lot of realism. And if we look, oh, just come over here, there we go. And this is what we get when we bring all of these tools together. So right up here at the top, we have, um, the kind of the big downtown city from the Matrix, Matrix Awakens demo. You can also see down here on the uh, right over here, this is a, just taken right from uh, one, of, excuse me, one of the streets. And then over here we have the, um, oh, I just forgot the name of this one, uh, Ancient Demo, uh, Valley of the Ancients Demo. I always forget that one. 
Um, and this is showing us uh, basically the open world tools plus a little gameplay. And the Matrix Awakens one is showing us um, uh, more of a, a city style scape with some gameplay. So we have a combination of both. And you can see, you know, if I have a, uh, an open world that's going to be more, uh, say, mythical or fantasy, you can take a look at the Valley of the Ancients demo and kind of see how we kit bashed a bunch of stuff together to make that one. And if you're targeting more realism or something that's more hyper realistic or more modern, you can check out the, uh, the city demo to get a, um, a sense about how both of those were built. And again, both of them utilize the exact same set of tools, which is really, really amazing because these two demos couldn't be any different from one another, but they still both run at 60 FPS. And they both allowed the, uh, the creators to do pretty much whatever they wanted with these tools. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the open world template. So. I am gonna pop over here to Unreal real quick, just make sure my Unreal is going. And uh, there we go, all right. Let me come back here, hold on one second, gotta do a little window magic. So, right out of the box, the blank first person, third person, top down and vehicle game are going to uh, support, are going to have support for massive open worlds right out of the gates. What I mean by that is if I come up here to file, I'm gonna go uh, new level. Actually, sorry, take that back. I'm gonna do one other thing first here. Uh, we're gonna open up my launcher really quick. I'm just gonna bring this on the screen for you. Let's hope my launcher actually works. Shazam, there we go, all right. Um, come over here to the engine, and we're just gonna launch this really quick because um, I wanna show you something in the actual project uh, project browser, which I can't get to from my current window. So just give me a second for that to come up. And there we go. And of course, it doesn't have any of the templates that I need here, so. Go figure. So let's just pretend uh, that this window right here uh, looks just like this window I have right here, because uh, they are the same if they had the, the content in there. And uh, the ones that I have highlighted, the blank, the first person, third person, top down, and vehicle, those are all going to have the uh, open world template ready to go. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to use it. It just means, and I know that this, uh, this particular slide will work, so if I come over back over here to my engine, if I come up here to my file new level, I have this open world, open world, empty, basic, and then empty level. So any of those templates that I was using before, when I go to make a new level in it, I can just click something like this open world, hit create, and there we go, I have an actual level that is ready to work with the open world tools and all of the things that uh, actually need to be set. And that's what I'm gonna be going over in the next couple of slides. You can set all this stuff up for yourself, but working from the template ensures that you have everything set up ready to go, um, including this first option of enable streaming. So under world settings, under world partition, you can check on enable streaming. This is only supported though if you are using the, uh, the world partition template. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna come over here, and of course it's not up, so we're gonna go to Windows, World Settings, and there we go, World Partition Enable Streaming right there. So again, this is enabled by default because I'm working inside of the template, and I'm just gonna go through and show you kind of the different options that they have. You can set those up for yourselves, but again, work from the template, because the template's already gonna do all of this for you. All right, so. Um, so we talked about the, uh, the open world and the empty open world, the main difference between the two. One is completely empty, and the uh, open world, this one right here, this comes with world partition enabled, one file per actor enabled, data layers, hierarchical level of details. This terrain is about two by two kilometers. Uh, it has a special material on it for landscape. Uh, the lighting's been set up for outdoor. Um, it's got a sky atmosphere, skylight, directional light, exponential height fog, and volumetric clouds. So basically, this template has everything that you need in order to just get started working, populating a level, or building it out the way that you want. You don't have to work with these tools in any different way. You can still work with the landscape by, say, importing a custom height map and just placing down actors. 
It just means that all of the extra little options that you would need to enable have already been enabled in setup for you. And setup is a key word here because the grid, which is the main, uh, so the main way that things are streamed in and out can be a little difficult to understand when you first open it up. And the reason I say that is because this uh, the cell size right here, this is 25600, so this is uh, 256 meters, right? Because Unreal uses centimeters. So this can be sometimes a little confusing. And basically what this grid is doing is it is saying that our cells are gonna be around 256 meters square. So each one of these cells are these little white lines that you see right here, and we can actually see these in the editor too. If I come over here back to my editor, and we're gonna go preview grids, there we go. There are my, my cells. So all the information that I place inside this world is gonna be located uh, inside of one of these cells, and the cells actually have a distance at which they will be loaded and unloaded. So by default, you have a cell size of 256 meters, and then at 768 meters, that information is gonna start to disappear or start uh, being cold. And all of this is taken care of for you, again, automatically by something called the streaming source. So let me just pop over here real quick. So the uh, streaming source is basically a grid of cells within a or should, sorry, said that wrong. The streaming source at one time helps stream in and stream out a series of cells or those little, pop back over the editor. Basically, these little white boxes that you're seeing, it's gonna start to stream that content in and out. Now, streaming is determined by two things. It is determined by either your player controller or there is an additional uh, uh, streaming source. And you can see, if you add it right here, there's the world partition streaming source. Um, what this does is, let's say that you teleport your player from somewhere in your world to somewhere else in the world, and that teleportation happens very fast. So as soon as you get that person there, you want the content to, to be shown. You don't want it, the person to get there, and then all of a sudden the content starts to kind of populate. Um, that is what this uh, streaming source component does. So you have one that's actually on the player controller. So I'm just gonna come here, and we're gonna go to my, let me do one other thing here, one second, sorry. So we're just gonna add a feature, oh, of course, there's no feature content packs on here, I can't do that. Um, oh, that's why. So right here, in my third person, give us a second to uh, start up. And I need my, uh, where's my player controller? So what we're gonna do, so this is our world partition streaming source. We can add this to our player controller. Again, by default, this should be added to our, uh, our player controller for using, say, the blueprint, the third person blueprint template. Um, it will already have that set up. So we won't need to actually add this to our player controller. I'm just showing you this now um, in case you need to know where to use it. Um, and one other thing come over here to my class defaults, and there should be, here we go. So there's also our um, uh, world partition enable here. So there's two ways that I can enable this. I can either add this as a component um, right here, or it is built into our, our player controller. We can see this right here, world partition enable streaming source, streaming source should activate um, and the runtime grid should probably be called, uh, we can see what it's called right here. And here we go, uh, grid, here we go, main grid. So we'll just copy this over here real quick. And we'll tell it it's the main grid. <sighs> G buttons keep messing me up. <sighs> we'll just type it in. 
There we go. I'm also going to delete this guy really quick. Um, oh, did I? Okay, thank you. Let's uh, try that one more time now. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Thank you. It's the, there's a G button on the side right next to the control. I keep hitting that, and it keeps screwing stuff up. M A. There we go. Ah, and it's got a backslash in there. Of course it does. I swear I can type. Um, okay. So we've talked a little bit about the streaming sources. And again, if you use the template and you're like, oh, this is so complicated, I'm not going to understand any of this when I get out of here after he's done talking, it's, it's all good. Just use the template. The template already has all of this set up for you. And there's a reason I keep pushing on the template. It's literally because one, one missed checkbox, one missed option, there will be a whole cascading effect of, of problems and bugs that you'll have to dig through. Just use the template. It's already set up. There's nothing wrong with using the template. Um, in fact, uh, one of the games that uh, you might have played, anybody ever played Ark Survival in here? I don't know if you know this or not, but Ark Survival was actually made off of the first person template inside of Unreal Engine 4. In fact, for a number of years, it said first person template when you would run the game in unwindowed mode. So there is no shame in using the template to get yourself started, okay? Everybody does it. Arc is a massively successful game. We actually put in an option so that you could rename your project so it didn't say first person shooter there. It could now say Arc Survival or whatever your game happens to be. But again, use the template. You can build everything off the template. It is not cheating. It is not cheating to use the template. So, all right. So we're going to talk now about streaming the grid. So, streaming and the grid are two vinyl con components for. Uh, the loading of cells around them. Um, when you are actually going through your world, you're going to see um, in one slide here, towards the end I'll show you this debug command, that's actually going to show you what is being loaded, what is pending loading, what is pending being killed, and what is, um, I think if there was a failure, oh, I forgot one, yeah, fail to load. Um, and basically as we traverse through the world, um, let me just show you something here real quick. Uh, of course I can't select from there. Here while I get this, because I can't select it out of my notes for some reason. There we go, Control C. So there's a little command, and we'll go over the command in a few more slides, but I just want to show this to you now. Close that. Really high in the world, so open up my console, hit Control V, and it's basically the same image that you see up there in my slide, but I just wanted to show it to you because as I traverse very slowly through the world here. We're going to see different things kind of load and unload. Um, this world isn't very populated, so when we get to my other demo level, um, we'll, we will see that and we'll uh, make a little bit more sort, uh, make a little bit more source. Shouldn't try to talk and read at the same time. It'll make a little bit more sense. Um, there is one other cool thing that we can do here. I'm just going to hit play again. And I'm um, going to hit the tilde key. I'm going to hit the up key. I'm going to hit space and then zero to disable that one. I'm going to hit the tilde again, and then I'm going to enable the runtime 3D. And this one's kind of cool because it actually shows you the various cells in 3D. Um, it's not any different than the 2D version. This just, just happens to show you uh, the information, say, vertically. Um, if you have a lot of verticality in your level, that might be something that uh, you might need. So. Let's go here, we're gonna hit escape, and let's see, okay. And let's pop back over to our presentation here. All right, so let's say that you are working on a UE4 level, you are going into UE5 because you wanna make use of all this awesomeness, but you don't really want to uh, manually, say, recreate all of your work. Um, there is a whole page of documentation on how to use Unreal's commandlet system. And for those of you who are not aware, Unreal has an entire commandlet system that can be used to process data at the command line, so you don't actually have to open up the editor. You can run a commandlet to do things like resave all your textures or recompress all your animations. There's thousands of them that you can run. And one of them is this uh, world partition conversion commandlet. Um, the Doc link right down there at the bottom goes to the uh, page where I pulled this 
from, but basically what this will do is it will take your current Unreal Engine 4 level and then run through the conversion process to bring it into a level that can work with all of the open world tools, right? Because you need to have that one file per actor, you need to have the streaming grid, you need to have, there's like six other tools, I just forgot the name of like three-fourths of them. Uh, let's see, world partition, streaming source, HLOD, uh, data layers, basically everything that you would need to, to ensure that you have a, a good starting point, these commandlets can kind of help you get there. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about the tools. I'm gonna open each one of them up so that we can kind of have a look at them. And the first one is gonna be world partition. Now this is split up into two things. We have our world partition editor, and then you can see here this is uh, again an image of the streaming grid, right? Because the individual cells that we see in here are what is actually gonna be streamed in and out in this image over here. So the data that we're seeing here, like this green cell here and this green cell here, um, are gonna correlate to what we're seeing here in our world partition. And what I mean by that is, let's pop over here to our editor, we're gonna come here to our world partition. Before I do that, I'm gonna come up here, I'm gonna enable my level um, filter so I can open up this little map that I put together. Uh, so it's just a little thing like this. And so here's my world partition. I'm just gonna go like so. And within this tool, I can do a lot of cool stuff. Like I can come here and I can load these selected cells. Maybe I selected too many of them, hold on. All right, let's try to unload selected cells. There we go, so I unloaded them. Um, if I come back over here, I'm gonna hit two on the keyboard to go to a little area that I, um, I uh, bookmarked. Um, I can come here and maybe I want to, I don't know, move my camera here and then let's like unload the cell and maybe we load all the cells at this, this location. My camera was under the ground, that's why it looked like it had a little bit of an issue there. Um, let me see, so the, uh, The world partition system, this little system that you're seeing right here, this, uh, uh, the grid and everything, um, or I should say the image that you're seeing, this is generated if I come up here to my build and I go to my build minimap. Oops, I did not want to do that. Um, I just wanted to show you that option. There we go, build minimap. What that's gonna do is it's actually going to build this minimap for you. Um, and this is actually really cool, this is just a byproduct of using the open world template. Without that, we would have to generate that minimap somehow, which could be actually pretty hard to do. And just by utilizing our open world template, we already have our minimap ready to go. So the next thing that I'm gonna talk about is level instancing, but this isn't the typical style of level instancing that you might be thinking of, literally like having a level and then making an instance of all of those objects. The level instancing that we're talking about in this case deals with two things. One, how do we kit bash a bunch of assets together without polluting our world outliner or just making it absolutely ridiculously hard to go through our world outliner? And what I mean by that is over here, I'm just gonna dock our world partition back. I said dock, there you go. And look at all these, these rocks that I have over here. Like, there's just, there's tons of them, right? And this is just, I have a folder, yes, I know it's a folder of meshes, but there is a ton of stuff inside of here, and it just keeps going and going and going. You can see I unloaded ones and things like that. So how could I cut down on a lot of this and make it so that it's just a little bit easier to, to manage some of this stuff? And I can, again, I can do that through either a level instance or a packed level actor. Now, there's a huge difference between the two of them. Uh, the, the create level instance, this is gonna be used whenever you need to package up something that changes within your project. So inside of Fortnite, all of the bases for all of our buildings are uh, level instances. And we can spawn these level instances inside of other level instances. There's a lot of nesting that you can do now, which previously wasn't possible. Um, you could use them for things like, uh, you can also have, oops, sorry about that, multiple instances of the same level instance in the world. And again, this wasn't po possible with Unreal Engine 4. You could only have one level instance inside of your world. 
So the, um, and again, the use cases for creating a level instance would be like a point of interest, uh, maybe a house or some type of like gameplay asset setup. So you have some collection of assets and maybe a collection of blueprint code that powers those assets. Um, packed level actors, or I'm sorry, level instances are mainly for things that need to be dynamic or update um, throughout the lifetime of your, your project or your project while it's playing. The packed level actors are slightly different. What they do is they take whatever objects you have and replace them with an instanced static mesh version of that object, and they are purely built to make things run faster. And the Matrix Awakens demo, they used packed level actors for all of the buildings and all the building's facades, while in um, the ancient demo, they used uh, level instances because some of that stuff actually needed to update with gameplay. So again, the main difference between the two, level instances are for when we want to actually have a little bit of content that changes with the game. Maybe it's a building that explodes, maybe it's something that updates when the, uh, the user reaches a certain goal inside of the level. And then the packed level actors are for when we want to take something and speed it up. So let's just pop over here to my, my editor real quick. I'm gonna hit one on the keyboard. I'm gonna have to uh, reload a bunch of stuff, so just give me a second here. All right, so let's see. I have a bunch of these rocks right here, right? And there's just, there's a whole bunch of them. They're like, if I hit Shift E, I have like, I don't even know, uh, 37 of them, right? 37 of these objects, so they are right there. Now, if I know that all 37 of these are never going to move, right, they're just gonna be purely used as stuff on the ground, what I could do is I can come here, right click, level, create a uh, packed level actor. We're gonna center it at the center bin Z and just press OK. And we'll say new map. And now what should happen, there we go, save my blueprint. And you can see it converted it right here. And if we look inside of my folder, this is my, this is it right here. So you can see it's basically a blueprint, but each one of these is an instant static mesh component. And the other cool thing I can do about this is if I right click on this, I can go edit. Notice that my world has kind of gone uh, gray, but I can still see these uh, assets in here. So what I can do is I can come here and I can like make a copy. We move this one out, it can be rotated, um, move this over here, and then once I'm done, we can go commit. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna update this, but it's gonna update it for however many instances I have placed around the world. So if I was to come back here, and let's see, we'll add another one of these guys over here, then I'm gonna hold Alt and put another one over here, and like so. It's nanite awesome, look at all these. There's like millions of triangles right here. So, look at that, I did all of that, and then if I just come up to one of these guys, and I go level, edit, um, you know, maybe I like bring one up for whatever reason, and we're gonna go level, and we're gonna go commit, and now you see I have that one that's like basically raised up all over the place. And again, this is super powerful, um, because we're gonna go to my, Oh, do this, there we go. Uh, I was looking for my outliner. But now you see I have these like these new BPs right here. And hold down shift. So, and there's like, what, 12 instead of having, shift E, uh, 46, right? And out of those, those 12, it's actually just one, right? But it's one that I have duplicated across the entire map. So that's, uh, one of the really, really cool things about these packed level actors is that I can instantly go in, I can come here, I can edit whatever I want, change it, commit. And the other cool thing too is I can also, um, I can break this, so I can break it apart if I wanted to. So let's say that I placed it down and I wanted to use that as a template to get started on something else. I could then break this, start adding a bunch of stuff, and then make a new one based off of the stuff that I broke apart from it before. So I can constantly be breaking and adding or adjusting. I'm not really stuck um, using this in one particular way or for one particular set of assets.
right. So um, one file practice is something I want to spend a little time talking about because it works a lot differently than you're going to be used to. It also generates a ton of files because remember, one file per actor literally means every actor in my project is now going to have a file. I put a point light in, it's a file. I put a static mesh in, it's a file. I put a skeletal mesh in, it's a file. New blueprint, it's a file, right? They're gonna be a one-to-one -one file that I see on my hard drive versus what I see inside of the editor. Um, this will make your perforce, uh, this is a little bit of a different flow. Um, you're gonna be doing a lot of uh, checking in and checking out through the editor. Um, so. The other reason that I want to bring this up is that one file per actor, if you notice here, to enable it, we go to experimental tools and then enable one file per actor. Um, the reason that it's under experimental is this will only work when you're using the open world, the world partition tools, um, and all of the other stuff that comes with the template. This is why I push so hard on the template, because some of this stuff will not work outside of the world partition tools and things like that. So you have to use kind of all of these together to get the benefits of everything. You can't just, at this point, pick and choose which tools I wanna use and which tools I don't wanna use. We have to use them all. Um, one file per actor can also be extremely uh, granular or done across the entire project. I can have only certain assets that I want go down to one file per actor. Um, you can see here we have, uh, in our world settings, we can use external actors, and this will do it across the entire world. Or if we come down here to our details under packaging mode, we can have external or um, I believe it's, none. I have to look now because I forgot what the name of it was. There we go, my details. version of Unreal is this. Okay. Uh, the, I wasn't expecting that, but so, I was expecting this to be uh, 5.0, so they've made a change recently, um, but basically, um, in the newer versions of Unreal, uh, 5. Point, I think it's uh, 5.1, so the next version that is coming out, you no longer have to uh, worry about packing your uh, one file per actor in the level. It is just going to be um, enabled or disabled on the entire project. Sorry about that. I didn't know what version of Unreal I was going to be with here at the uh, at this show. Uh, so the next one that I want to talk about is data layers. And data layers is actually one of my favorite things to work with because data layers opens up the layer workflow like you would expect expect layers to work inside of UE5. So inside of data layers. I'm gonna come over here to my editor again, and we are going to, uh, my, ugh, my stuff is kinda messed up. That's not the one that I wanted though. Uh, oh yeah. So I don't have any here, but I'm just gonna create one. And there we go, so I've created it. And then what I can do is let's just, I don't know, we'll grab some assets. So let's say Shift E, right click, and we can do uh, move selected. Oh wait, hold on. Move daters to, let's just create, yeah, add selected layers to new data layer. There we go, and let's just rename this one. Rocks. So I have my rocks data layer, and then I can uh, save selected. I can easily turn them on and turn them off like so. So it's pretty simple, but this actually used to be a little bit complicated inside of Unreal. Um, the other cool thing about these data layers, though, is that I can actually turn these on and off at runtime. And this is really powerful, because this means that you have a lot more control over what your project's going to look like on, say, the PS3 versus the PS4 versus the PS5, or say Xbox One X versus Xbox One, or maybe the Switch versus what it's gonna look like on PC. And 
again, the cool thing about these data layers is that I don't have to use them for just one specific thing. I can use them purely for uh, managing stuff inside of the editor, or I can use them for managing performance when this project is run across multiple platforms. So the next tool that I want to talk about is HLOD. Now, HLOD is going to work a lot different in the open world template than you might expect. So normally, if we come up here to do our HLOD, you would enable the hierarchical LOD outliner, which actually isn't available. And that's because for HLOD, you just come up here and you build your HLODs. However, to set data in your HLOD, we have a little uh, actor. I'm just going to go ahead and make a new one. And it is under miscellaneous, and it's called an HLOD layer. I'm just going to open it up. And the cool thing about these is that we can actually adjust um, or change. So we have instancing, which would just take whatever is there, swap it out with an instance. We then have uh, merged mesh that would just take everything and merge it all down. We then have simplified mesh and approximate mesh. So simplified mesh will um, replace it with a brand new set of geometry and materials. And then approximate mesh does the exact same thing. This one's just for nanite objects or objects that have a lot of vertices inside of them. And the cool thing about this is that I can have one of these LOD layers for all types of different stuff. So I could have one for foliage. I could have one for roofs. I could have one for walls. I could have one for the river stones. I could have one for pretty much anything that I would want. And then I can control. Um, let's see if I do like a simplified mesh here. You can see here I have my proxy settings as well as my uh, merge material. So I can control all the settings that I want for each one of those. So I no longer have to have the HLOD settings just applied across the entire map. I can now have HLOD build things specifically how I want them. So for example, you might have it set up where uh, you use instancing specifically on all your foliage, but let's say that you have a, um, a building that is made out of a bunch of ident identical static mesh parts, where you could have that set down to mesh merge so that it's gonna merge everything down. Um, let's say that you found out maybe mesh merge isn't doing good enough for you at objects in the distance and they need to be just drastically reduced. We can then have those objects in the distance. Instead of that, we could simplify their mesh. And then under here, under our proxy, we can change uh, basically how complex that mesh is going to be generated. And then under our materials here, we can determine what materials we want to use for it. So do we need a roughness map or can just a constant parameter work? Um, now, to build this, and I've never built it on this computer, so I'm not going to try, but we just come up here and we build our HLODs. Um, one of the cool things about this, though, is that it is uh, multi-core process enabled, so the more cores you have, the faster this will build. It actually does a really, really, really good job of building your HLODs. Um, let me come here and do something really quick so we can see them. Um, there's a little bit of a bug inside of Unreal that prevents this from happening, so... We are just going to do this really quick. We're going to come all the way down here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to disable our landscape. Yeah, I know. All right. So this right here, this lovely little thing you see with the, the cross in the center is my HLOD. Uh, this cross, this will be fixed. Um, this is actually a bug. The cross is signifying that the, for whatever reason, when this is built, it doesn't think that that stuff in the center needs to be rebuilt. It thinks that it's loaded all the time. That's why it's showing up like with this cross. But this here in the distance, um, these are my, my h -lod. So this is my h -lod of the terrain. And it's actually very, very fast to build. Um, and the best part is, is once you set everything up with an h -lod, uh, layer asset, you can just build. And that's all you have to do, you just have to build. You don't have to worry about it. You just build it, and it will be done. So now the next two items, virtual textures and virtual shadows, these two things aren't necessarily required to make open worlds work, but they will help that content run a little faster and work a little better across multiple platforms. Virtual textures um, is needed to do the minimap, but that's the only thing that you need, need it for unless you're actually utilizing virtual textures through your project. Um, and the virtual shadow maps are going to work really well. Um, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but this uh, image right here, um, what I did is I just blew up that little 
little uh, section right there to kind of show you the, basically the advantages of the new shadowing system versus virtual shadows. And one of the things also on virtual shadows that we will get is if um, the roof tiles, notice how they ha each tile kind of has a little bit of a shadow coming back because of the way of the light. We would never have been able to see that information with our old school shadow system simply because we wouldn't have enough resolution. There just wouldn't be enough resolution to show that type of detailed shadow information in anything that would be even close to acceptable performance at runtime. Um, and again, virtual shadows aren't necessarily needed to use the open world tools, but all of this stuff put together is gonna help, right? It's like you don't necessarily need windows on your car for your car to work, but it does keep the bugs out of your face, right? And then the other one is gonna be Nanite. So Nanite is just our virtualized uh, geometry. This is literally gonna make your project run insanely fast um, with an insane amount of detail. Um, let's see, control H. And I'm just gonna try to do this really fast. Go shift, enable that. And then let's just hit one. And like all these little rocks here, these are all nanite meshes. And what I did is I actually just like duplicated this out by holding alt, and then I would come here and I would scale it down just a little bit. Pull it up. And what this would do, oh, uh, is it would give me these just big rocks, medium-sized rocks and small rocks, all made from the same asset. And if we look at this asset, let's just hit control E. This is uh, 999,000 triangles or basically all of the triangles that it took to build Virtual Fighter um, inside of one static mesh, which is pretty cool, in, in my opinion. So, um, the last slide that I have here is going to be uh, the debug commands. So there are two debug commands that we can run. There is the uh, WP runtime dot toggle runtime hash 2D grid. And basically all this is gonna do is it's gonna show you where your assets are loading where you are inside of the world. So as I traverse through my level, it's gonna show me what's pending loading, what is currently being loading, or more importantly, if something failed to load. I can see maybe something didn't get cooked right or maybe something wasn't set up correctly inside of the grid. And this tool can help me uh, do that. And it's not on here, but let me just pop over here to this. And we did this a little bit earlier in the talk, but I'm gonna hit the tilde key or the uh, back tick key and I'm gonna go to my 2D grid just so that we can see this again. You can see here the, uh, the green indicates, um, we have a little key down here at the bottom. Let's see, see if everybody can see that a little bit better. But basically we, we show our unloaded, our, our loaded, unloaded still around, loading, loading but not visible, mark visible, loading visible, preloading, fail to load and then making invisible. So right from this, we can actually see, is something loading? Um, in this particular scene, I don't have the gameplay or anything like that, but maybe there is uh, you know, something that is toggled far off in the distance that, and this little uh, runtime 2D crash, it can show us like if something isn't gonna load, or if something is pending loading, or if something isn't in the right grid cell. Um, this just, it, makes it a lot easier to try to debug what is going on instead of just randomly clicking on stuff and trying to figure out why isn't this loading? Does it need to go into another cell? Is it pending kill? What is going on with this? So it's just one of the many tools that you have inside of your, uh, your tool belt to work with because this is complicated. This is complicated stuff and that's okay. We'll take the complication out of it by using the template and making sure that um, we use the debug tools that are provided just to have a look around at what's going on. So, let me just pop back over here and we'll go over our wrap up. And uh, so in today's training, we talked about the open world tools overview. Just basically went over kind of what this tool set is, what it can do for you and your projects. We then talked about the open world template, why you should use the template. Well, it's already set up for you to be successful. So. Don't fight the template, use the template at all times. We then talked about each of the open world tools and kind of what they do, and then we finished up with the open world debug commands. So I have like a minute left, um, probably not enough time to run up to the mic, so I will open up to questions. You can just come see me over at the side, and uh, that is it. I appreciate everybody coming to my talk, and I'll see you next time.
Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unreal Fest 2022. Very nice to see you all. Um, I hope you're enjoying this lovely in-person event, and I hope you've enjoyed some beignets. If you've been in New Orleans before, fantastic deep fried food. Please go find Café du Monde if you get a chance. But we are here to see Unreal, so let's show it off. So what we are gonna talk about today is advanced UI templating techniques. And I don't know what to say if UI is the last uh, session of the day, maybe it's how we all feel about UI sometimes. Always thought about last, but we know that it's most important in our hearts. And who's presenting this talk today? My name is Adrian Pugh. I'm a UI technical design director at um, Epic, particularly working on Fortnite. And my invisible colleague right next to me, Pablo Gruby, he couldn't make it here um, today, but you will be seeing him very shortly in this presentation. So what we will cover, we'll wanna cover some styling with widget inheritance. We wanna cover some layout templating with name slots, visual styling with material instances, and more stuff about materials animating with curves and animating inside of blueprints. Now something to note, at Fortnite, we use materials a ton in our UI. It is the clutch of how we develop our UI. So we wanna show you some of these techniques and we also wanna show you something that we literally have put in and maybe started prototyping about a month ago, which is our last point, which will be the smallest bit because <laughs> it's not polished yet. But we wanna show you some of the ways that we're incorporating materials and blueprint triggering at the same time. So let's get into it. What are we actually gonna show here today? We built you a lovely little card deck simulation and this includes on you know, one side you have your actual cards and on the other side is the deck building aspect. And we thought this, this would be a great way to indicate um, essentially the same data that needs to be styled differently across multiple cards and have more information in different contexts. So we thought that this was a great example to give you that idea. And rather than just show you, let's actually get into engine and see it in action. I'm sorry, everyone, I'm so short. <laughs> You're not gonna be able to see me over the monitors, but I'll try to do my best. So here's sort of the prototype in action. We've got the um, deck uh, card building side here over on the right, and then we actually have the cards over on the um, left-hand side, and we've got a focus uh, state, so a press, and we've got a nice little hover animation. And what we're gonna be showing you is the techniques that we put this together with. You notice that we actually have different idle animations for each individual icon. And we've got different styles here. This is all basically done with materials and a couple of widgets. So let's break down what we're doing here. If I go back to the presentation. First topic is styling with widget inheritance. So widget inheritance is essentially allowing us to overwrite various properties that we put in our parent widget that we want the child widget to change. And we basically use this concept to change from what our base widget is to style the card differently in different contexts. So in this principle, we're basically making a responsive layout. We're parameterizing those widget properties, inheriting from that, and then blowing all those properties up with whatever we want in the children. So, to introduce this concept to you, and this presentation is actually all of Pablo's idea, I wanna introduce my, Pav my colleague Pablo, who couldn't make it here, but here he is today. Dobry den, everybody, and thank you for joining us at Unreal Fest 2022. My name is Pablo Gruby. I am a technical UI design director on Fortnite. First of all, many thanks to Adrian Pew for presenting these concepts and techniques today. I will guide you through styling with widget blueprints and inheritance. Here on the left, you can see the card base widget and on the right is the widget inherited from the left one. We will try to make the widget on the right to represent the details of the card. First of all, imagine that you are a web developer working on a responsive website. You have a good old browser with CSS support and all you need is to define another style for your content. Let's start from the size of the card. At the root of the widget hierarchy I put a size box which allows me to define the size of the widget. If we want to make another style we should parameterize the width and height 
of the card. Let's add two float variables, one for width and one for height. We want to keep things tidy, so let's make a category for them. After compilation, we can set the default value of the variable. Now let's use the default values to set actual widget properties. Event preconstruct is executed in editor on any change, so it is easy to see the results straight away. We want to keep our blueprints tidy, connection straight, and reusable logic collapsed to functions. Now let's revert our default values for the base widget and change the default values for the inherited widget. The next thing we want to style would be the icon size. When increasing the image size, Rubbox pushes the content that doesn't fit to the new line. The easiest way to achieve that would be to parameterize the icon brush. We also want to have ability to swap the icons for different cards. Another variable of texture 2D type would serve that. The icon will look nicer if scaled down a little. The icon material supports scaling but we should provide the value for the corresponding material parameter. Again, we can set the default values of the variables after compilation. Let's quickly throw a bunch of setters in the blueprint. Now we can change the default values of the inherited widget to make it look as we want. Don't forget to revert the default values of the base widget. Next thing to modify would be the header text style. Let's call up the icon related blueprints into the function to keep it tidy. A variable of slate font and font type would be able to handle all the font styling parameters. And again, let's set the font of the text block on preconstruct with the default values from variable. In order to change text alignment, we should modify text justification. A variable of e-text justification type will help with that. Now let's modify the default values in the right widget blueprint. The last style in touch would be to increase the size of the mana cost element. A scale box will help with that. Again, collapsing the previous work into the function. Now we need a float variable to drive the user specified scale. Adding another setter on preconstruct to assign the default value of variable to user specified scale and changing the default value on the derived widget blueprint. And here is the result. So far we modified the car size, the icon size, textile and the manacle size. The last thing you would probably want to add is the data for the card. We want to be able to set up the header text and manacles on the widget instances. By the way, we already have a rival for the icon texture, which is also related to data. And again, setters on preconstructs for text blocks. Finally, 
setting the default values for the derived widget. And here is the final result. Thank you very much for your attention. Stay with us and there will be more exciting stuff from Adriana next. Let's go play again. No, um, but yeah, thank you, Pablo. So I'm gonna just quickly summarize what it is and then we'll get an engine to do it ourselves. So essentially we've got everything wrapped around with the wrap box, meaning anything that overflows will go to the next line. This will allow for the cards to have different designs because we can decide to push the content to the next line. Then we parameterize those uh, properties we want to control. As Pablo showed, we make little functions that we want to set those in. We inherit from our base uh, widget blueprint, basically can create um, our widget. So let's go into what that actually looks like. So I'm going to go into our lovely project here. I'm just going to make a new widget blueprint. I'm going to inherit from the base card. All is the same, WBP underscore card demo and voila we have a card right on here and you can see it's inheriting from our base we can go in we can edit the parent um, all is well in unreal land at the moment so if i want to make another instance of the card let's say i want to make a tall and skinny card so i'm going to set my width to 256 my height to 768 I want my icon size to probably fill to the next line, so I'm gonna set it the same as the container. And my icon height, let's set it the same. Now the size itself is a little, you know, flush, so let's uh, unflush it, give itself a little bit of space. And um, let's do the mana cost as well. Let's scale it down, let's make it a little adorable at 0.7, so it's really cute all up there in the corner and we turn off the grid and voila, I have a new style for the card. So this is the way that we can inherit the same data, use that card, place it anywhere we might want it. And that's essentially what we did with all the other content. So these other cards are inheriting from the base card and we add extra content inside. Spoilers, next topic. And same with this card, we expose a bunch of parameters, a bunch of properties, able to style things and inherit from these properties to do different things. So with that, let's go into the next topic. Templating with name slots. So name slots are inherently this empty container that you can add more widgets into in other instances of that particular widget being used. Now, this is the 5.1 part of this presentation talk. In 5.1, we now have inherited widgets can actually access that name slot widget hierarchy. So now you have a way that you can templatize layouts because you have a name slot where you can change out the layouts and a lot of the widgets inside. This essentially means that you can create maybe pop-up modules, all sorts of templatized ways that you can inherit from the same widget but see it in different contexts, see it with different visuals, and see it used in other areas. So inherited name slots, that's the new 5.1 feature, and 5.1 preview is what we're running this project on right now. So that's what we did here. We have a lovely little name slot at the very bottom. That's the green container here. We're able to style the card as we showed before. And inside of this name slot, we can add all the extra details that we want this card to have in a different context. So this, for instance, is going to have the text subtitle and the icon and description, little header, uh, I don't know, the wavy banner. And the last little bit is then we can obviously parameterize that added content and expose it to other areas inside where we want this widget to live. So. Let's go in and make that right now. I'm gonna close out some extra windows because uh, it'll be like Chrome where I have all of them open at once. We're gonna get there. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be like that. But you can see inside of our lovely demo, we have this empty name slot. So I want to add in some extra content. I'm gonna put a little overlay and Pablo used the size box. One of my favorite ways to take up space is using the spacer widget. Not Spicer, Spacer. And so we're gonna put this in here and I'm gonna force this wrap box to wrap to the next line by making my spacer the size of the container, which is 256. So now all my content has wrapped to the next line. Now, 
I want to adjust the uh, title. I'm sure it's bothering everyone else here. Let's center align that, please. <laughs> All right, now we can continue now that we don't have any issues with that. So I'm gonna t put in a vertical box and maybe th I'm thinking about a way that this um, card is maybe a leveling card. So you need to have progress bars and level this card's information. So let's actually put that in. Let's put in some progress bars. Let's do one in here and then I'm just gonna duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. Let's align our vertical box to the full width of the container. Then I wanna put in some padding. Let's put in a nice little 20. That's livable, we can all deal with that. And I'm gonna just do a little bit of padding on the top and bottom of our progress bars so they're a little bit more legible and let's zoom in for all the folks here. So now we have the card that has a different context of information. Inside of that empty name slot, we're able to add more information that's contextually aware of the card, but the card still has all the base card details from the parent, and so you can expand on this concept. Now, let's just add in some extra progress. Let's make it uh, all pretty. Let's see, it's down here, percent, and I'm just gonna fill these up make it look like something nice. So that's how easy it is. We can basically now have a lot of different card types that might have different or added contextual data, all inheriting from our base class. And you'll see that really comes in handy when we get into animations, because it's gonna animate exactly the same as all the other widgets, because spoilers, that's what we're talking about next. So let me alt tab visual styling with material instances. So like I said on Fortnite, we love materials. And we love material styles to be our style guide. So material instances essentially does that for us. So what we are gonna do is we're gonna make a material instance. We apply a bunch of properties that we want the instance to change. And then we have a material interface, and this is what we'll get into um, shortly. But essentially we can change out a style, a color, or anything on the material side rather than doing it on the widget side. That's what we prefer to do at Fortnite. And what we mean by material interface is that in our material function, we set a number of default parameter names. And these names are gonna be the same across every single material instance. And that means that if we wanna animate something, we don't have to remember to put in the material, the property name, it's actually in the function itself. So here is the function we're talking about. It basically has an idle state, a hovered state, focus state, press state, disabled state, all of these states that will blend between different colors. And so when we put this inside of a material, we don't necessarily need to call out the material properties because that's all in the material function. So no artist can accidentally name it the wrong way. You can't have user error this way. And so we're keeping all of our information contained in one area that we might need to change that um, information to. Take a deep breath. Whew. Talking fast, talking fast, folks. And what's useful there is because we can play an animation on those exact same properties no matter what widget or material. And so with um, the material instances, on the parent widget, we can say play animation A on hover and play animation C on child, or we could say play animation B on focus for the parent, and in the um, child widget, we say play animation B and D. So it could be additive, or you can negate the original animation. So we do this by first setting up a bunch of uh, functions that play these animations inside of our parent widget. Then we have the standard buttons events and we tie those functions to those events. So it's a one-to-one -one function to event. Then inside of the child widget, we can basically overwrite that function and then tack on the other functionality that we need when those events are triggered. And essentially you get the look that we have here, which is the difference between the deck on the um, right versus the animation of the cards on the left, we have more detail animations happening. Also the idle animation triggers. It doesn't trigger on the other instance, but it triggers on the child widget. So let's set that up in engine. 
Um, so right now I'm going to go into the base card and I'm going to show you what the animations are doing. So the animations are basically triggering a bunch of the exact same property names. Like I said, we have our material instance that uses exactly the same property names. We trigger those from a zero to one lerp. It's pretty, pretty standard. So let's actually then go into the material. So we've got our background material here. I'm going to hunt down. And then um, here's basically those uh, standard uh, material interface properties that I was telling you about. So if we go into the card, they're actually hidden under here inside of this material function, this lerp function. So in here are all those properties that you guys just saw. And also, spoilers, this is for later, but that's a later discussion. So this is what's going to animate between the colors. So all we have to do, if we want to have a different uh, visual color set for the focus, hover, press, all we have to do is make a material instance of this and plop it directly into where our card lives because our card is only animating on these standard sets of names. So it doesn't need to have a different animation. It doesn't even need to have any different um, information that it, ha basically, it's just going to run on its own. I'm so enamored, I'm tongue-tied. So let's make a material instance. MI, UI, card, all caps, background, uh-huh, demo. And in here, I want to switch my colors. So let's change the idle. This will be the most obvious. Let's do our lovely yellow. Hovered, let's go for an orange. Focused, I mean, we don't really show focus here, but pressed, um, I'll, I'll stick to around a blue over here. So we go back to our card demo. All we have to do is swap out that material with our new one. And because the animations are all going to play on the parent, all of these animations will actually work inside um, the editor. But let's first make an animation with something that we also want to play on top of the base animations. So I'm going to go in here, going to remove this, and actually let's start with the animation first. So I want to animate transition hovered. Let's say I want to animate some progress bars, but also what's really fascinating is you can see all the root, all the base widget, the parent widgets, um, widgets as well here. So you can actually animate on the parent widgets differently um, than you can from the child, which is actually what we do in some other instances. But let's do a progress bar, percent. We are going to start at 40, go to one, and go back to around 40.4. So we'll play this animation when hovered. So I'm going to go to the graph here. I'm going to again do the overwrite. So overwrite. I'm going to find my transition hovered. This is in the um, parent. And I'll just do a play animation off of this. So here we go. Here's our transition hovered. Plug it in. And of course, we need an unhover state. So let's make sure I get that. And I'm just going to do play in reverse. And the same animation is going to be in reverse. Now, all we have to do is place this into our core widget that contains all the other widgets. So I'm just going to find our card. Let's plop it on down here, our tall and skinny. And cross your fingers, everyone. It will animate because all the properties are exactly the same name. They have the same material instance inside of that material function. And all I have to do to style this differently is swap out the material and make sure I'm using that material function. And guess what? It does the hover animation on top. So all of that um, really easy to visually style and make different things. So that's exactly what we're doing with these two cards over here. They have a different material instance but the functionality is exactly the same. So you don't need to worry about having new functionality. It's all exactly the same base card, one of these. Um, so let's open up one of these widgets. 
And you can see the description hovered here is going to play the hover animation, but the hover animation is also going to turn on a widget that is inside of the parent. So on the image icon, we're gonna animate on this idling brush material. So when I, oh, I didn't mean to hit play, but that's fine. When I compile here, we're gonna get a warning that says um, is animating on a non-existent image icon widget. And that's a lovely warning, Unreal, but actually it will exist. But this is a new thing also with Unreal 5.0 is it gives you warnings when you're not animating on things that it thinks. So thank you so much, Unreal, for that descriptive detail. But don't worry, it's just a warning. We know what we do with warnings, we ignore. That is exactly what we all do here. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's the concept with the material instances now. Um, we're gonna get into the next little bit, which is animating the materials with the curve atlas. And this is kind of what I was showing with the icons themselves, how the icons have this fascinating idle animation. That is actually all done with curve atlases inside of the material. And let's break that on down. So a curve atlas is commonly used in VFX um, and all that amazing uh, technical art world, but we don't see them used that often in UI. So I wanna open everyone's minds to Curve Atlases, breathe it in, it's going to be a great time. A Curve Atlas is basically a massive texture, and I say massive because UI is usually, you know, 64 by 64, but it's a, it's a pretty large texture that can handle any amount of rows um, to fill up that texture that will give you these curves. Then you can use the material instance to determine which curve you wanna animate. It sounds a little bit more complicated than what it actually is, but here's this uh, setup in the material. We have this curve, and that curve essentially has a row that will do the different animations. So here's the curve atlas texture, and that's what I'm talking about, massive, a two, 256, oh, makes me all excited. So in this 256, we're just filling it up, each individual row with these um, various curves. And then we can swap out our material instance to use whatever curve we want to get a different animation style. So. Essentially, you can go in and get all these different animation styles out of one texture. You don't need to run different widget logic saying play animation A in sequencer if the icon is this or animation B. This is a really easy way that you can handle all this logic and visual styling just with material instances and not have to put that logic inside of the blueprints. And the fun thing is that you can play with curves. The curve editor is very fun. I click around in it all the time, I abuse it, and it's really responsive. As soon as you change this, you can almost see the update immediately. So it's not a bad way to work for artists to see their changes with the curve and see it almost update immediately in the engine. You don't even need to run Pi. So let's break that down for you. And so we're gonna go into the icon itself. And this material, we are doing the curves, we're basically animating the idling by um, using the screen position and adding or subtracting our curve data to the absolute position of this widget. And so here's the curve that we talked about. So here's the one of the curves and here's the atlas itself. So I'm gonna just make a material instance off of this so we can demo it. And Icon, demo, great. And in here, I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna turn the checkerboard on, I'm gonna show the border so we can kinda see what's happening and let's default the animation to one on so we can see what this is doing. It's actually moving out of the frame. So that, cause that's what offsetting the position will do is actually move it from its current position. And we can change the curves that we're using here so I could change it to powers, I can change it to this other powers that does like more of a bob up and down. And here's like a more floaty animation, et cetera. So again, really easy. You could just swap out any animation style, no blueprint logic needed, just plug in the various material instance you want. Now let's go make a curve. So to make a curve, we have our curve atlas here. I'm gonna go into curves. I'm going to go in miscellaneous. Curve is here, curve atlas is there. Let's do our linear curve. This could be animations demo. 
Now, the one thing that I'm doing, because I'm shifting the position of the icon, I want all my values to go from zero back to zero. I don't want anything to start at one, so we're just gonna drag and move all the, wow, that has never happened, it's never been that, it's never been that nice to me. <laughs> never selected all of them at once, I'm very stunned. Um, and then the middle mouse button will uh, add a key, or you can right click, add a key. So I'm gonna add a key here, and on the red channel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bump this all the way up to 20, because we wanna move it 20 pixels. <laughs> so we're no longer in the realm of zero to one. And if you repin it, it, I found that that will scale it all nicely. So we've got our curve, now we have to add it to the actual texture atlas, because it's not in our lovely texture atlas yet. So if we go to our texture atlas, our tiny little rows here, let's add another. And we want our animation demo. So that added another curve, a uh, single pixel line to our texture. You could see how many animations you could actually store in one texture. It's quite a bit. Um, so let's swap out this. So now we're playing this animation demo. And what I've set it up in the material is that the red channel will shift the icon over to the left. Because lefts and rights are really hard for me. Bear with me, I'm gonna try to be like, shift it over, uh, left. So this will shift it over to the left. But because um, Curve Atlas textures can't go negative, so instead of doing a negative value, putting out of the curve, I put the ability to shift the icon over to the um, right in the blue channel. So I kind of split up the red and the blue to be left or right, moving along the horizontal axis. So if we adjust, well, let's just show off the blue right now. Um, at 20 pixels, I save this, we go back to our material instance, and you can see it's shifting the icon over to the right instead. And then guess what? You can chain them together. So sometimes it's a little difficult, so I'm gonna just only solo one of these um, because sometimes their keys like to overlap each other. And I'm gonna go back to the red channel, put it over here, oh, put this back snap the grid, and now we should have a very smooth to left to right idle animation going on. But curves are not meant to be linear. Curves can be anything, so we can just literally then add easing, do all sorts of fun um, animations, and now that's adding an easing into our animations here, and this then simplifies it down to a texture, so you're not having that extra uh, Bezier curves that you're reading on the GPU or any of that, it's actually all consolidated into one texture, very cheap to run, very cheap to use, and again, you're not having crazy widget logic to get this to run. All you have to do to play this demo is we would go into our demo card and it's not exposed in this one, it's exposed um, in the, I think it's exposed in the base. No, I don't remember, but in here, we can just swap out our icon material to our demo, and now it's hidden. Oh, nope, wrong one, that demo. And sometimes this doesn't update, but we'll also do it here for good measure. Ta-da, where's my demo? Lots of demos here. Sometimes I've had an issue with these updating lately. This is just a 5.1 preview, I believe. Um, but if that doesn't work, we can always modify another card that has it working. No, alas, alas. I was fearing this, but it's fine. We'll go into our, our core, um, One's over here, and let's just swap out the potion with our demo. And we should be able to run this. And so our potion now on the um, hover animation, because that's when I trigger it, is doing our demo curve animation at the moment. So that's, a, again, a way that we can have individual icons have different animations without any widget blueprint logic overhead. It is truly just animating inside of the material using offsets. So that's also what these two are using. They're using material instances that hover up, hover down, and the same with these stars. So 
that is the concept there. Now let's go into um, the fun and final bit, animating materials with blueprints. And again, this is the most experimental thing that we have been working on. Um, so what we wanted is we wanted to find in our material function a transition that we want to animate from zero to one. And then we want to essentially use the blueprint logic as if it were a play animation node to trigger all those actual animations inside of the material itself. So we're basically going to uh, remove sequencer out of the picture and just have the material handle all of the animation logic in uh, including a macro. So I want to give massive credit to um, Athena. She's the UI technical design director. She's been just kind of experimenting with this for fun um, on her free time. And so I'm very excited to show it to you in engine. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the material, which this is why I told you I was going to have too many windows open. Gotta, I gotta close it down. All right, let's go into our base card material. And the spoiler that I told you about before, um, we essentially have this material function that animates the timer. So this says play duration, loops, play time, time direction, speed, start time. And if you are familiar with uh, UMG play animation, these look an awful lot like the play animation settings. In fact, they are identical to the play animation settings. So we've created this macro that can basically simulate play animation without actually using sequencer and it does all of this inside of the material itself. So if I go into this macro, it gets the material and it will set those various parameters in the material to do all of these functionality. And guess what? That's exactly what this material function is doing. Now I'm gonna go into this. No, nobody, nobody scream. <sighs> It's a little complicated. We're still working on it. We're still working out, you know, what's the more efficient way, how many things we want. But it's still pretty impressive. We can trigger all this functionality just in the material itself so we can pass all of that onto the GPU and not necessarily have it um, as extensive on the CPU. So all we have to do is move these over to our named reroute nodes. Save and go back to our card here and we're just going to remove all of these play animations and trigger the macro instead. So that was hovered. Uh, this is unhovered. We've got pressed and there is no unpressed because you can't undo a state of pressing. I've thought about this a lot during this presentation, just so anyone's aware. And all we have to do now is hit play and we have exactly the same functionality here without any sequencer animations happening. So this is, can do exactly what sequencer can do, but it's actually inside of the material itself. And this is handy because we're trying to think of like really cool animations we want to do, but in materials it's like on, either it's playing a looping animation or off. This allows us to trigger way more things dynamically in the material that we can have like say set up to, you know, gameplay data. We could speed things up in the material or not and have all of that be more dynamic data passing in. So that's something that we're working on. And if I go back to, I've lost my window. If I go back to the card base, so we're gonna go back to hovered. Again, a great thing, we can just change the time, duration, et cetera. And this is all just being passed into the blueprint itself. Changes the five loops. And we run this. And it's very fast. <laughs> Trying to do those loops. Let me see what I might have messed up. Yeah, play duration's only at uh, 0.1 of a second. So that's quite fast to try to get five loops in. But at one second, we'll see five loops triggering. We can ping pong, we can do all sorts of fun things. And again, all of this is just being passed directly into the material rather than sequencer or other things. So it's just some fun visual logic that we kind of want to show with you today. And that will generally conclude this talk from standard to experimental. So thank you for joining us, everyone.